Hey everyone and welcome to another guide. Today we're doing Cassadin. This has been a long-awaited guide. Basically every single comment section someone bugs me about when are you doing the Cassadin guide? Finally it's here. I've got my uh, trusty sidekick Alados, longtime MLA member, uh, Cassadin guru, also with the face reveal. I've actually never seen <laughs> Alados's face before this moment even though I've known you for a while. So thank you for taking the time here to uh, make this guide with me. You've put a lot of effort into this. Basically, all of the clips here are from Alodos' gameplay. He is a very, very good Cassidy. And sits around Grandmaster, what, five, 600-ish LP on the European US server. Um, so yeah, thanks for coming by. Um, we'll get into the details here today. There's a lot we've got to cover. We're gonna start with expectations because Cassidy, obviously, very unique journey. Um, so let's go through you know, a few of these. First 30 games are the most painful. Anything you'd like to comment here? Yeah, so when you start Cassadin, the me mechanical floor for the champion is very high compared to like many other champs. The entry point is high, so it's gonna be painful because also the early game is very, very hard to get like the flow off. But once you get that, it will be it will be fine. Yeah, hundred percent. And a lot of this guide is gonna be really really getting into the details of how can we have a consistent early game so that we can actually get into the mid game in a somewhat decent position. So a lot about minimizing, neutralizing, a small little, a lot of small little laning tidbits. There's gonna be a lot of games here that you're gonna feel like a god, and there's gonna be ones that you're feeling absolutely useless. That is kind of the uh, solo queue contract with Cassidy right there. Like you said, you know, Cassidy is not too hard to execute, but extremely punishing on mistakes. If you get behind early, you can feel like an absolute minion. Um, and I think this is a really great, great little tidbit here. Some matchups are a win because you're only down 20 CS. So what are some matchups like this? I'm assuming like Akshan or something or? Yeah, like the the Akshans, the Lucian mid was like a historical example of matchups where Kassadin doesn't really have the best ways of like controlling the lane. So those can be very hard. Yeah, just not dying in lane. Sometimes not dying. Yeah, just not dying sometimes is yeah, just enough. Like if you're playing against those Especially those AD melee bruisers, like the Renektons, the sets. If they get a kill on you, you might be out of the game already. So you have to be very careful. Yep, and getting a getting a reset without losing too much. These are very small things. Again, note throughout this uh, this this guide, guys. Sometimes getting a great reset or getting a good getting the wave in under the tower to make sure it bounces back to you, to make sure it's not frozen, or being able to play off the bounce freely. These very, very small things go an extremely long way with Cassidy. Sometimes the win is just not going down too much XP. So, and, and this is another thing, guys. You cannot win every single game. There are going to be games where you're just going to sit there, you're going to farm your ass off, and then nothing is going to happen, right? You're just going to slowly sit there. You're not really going to offer much. And that's just the reality. We are, going to, we are going to have these games that aren't winnable. So that's very, very important that we understand this at an expectations level heading into this guide. So... This is where it gets spicy, Alados. True style of, 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 of Cassid in here. Walk us through this one. So right now, there are two main ways of playing Cassid in. First one is the Assassin style. And the second one is like a more tanky Bruiser style. And as you mentioned in earlier guides, we, this is where we want to align our setups, align our builds, and align like everything with how we want to play the game. And that will dictate Cassid identity as well. So what makes assassin so, style of Cassidy? And walk us through what makes an assassin style of Cassidy versus the tank bruiser. So the assassin style is very strong into squishies. It's like a fast-paced assassin setup, basically, that focuses on stat checking people, like one-shotting them with like items like the Ludens, the Sorks, the runes like Electrocute or First Strike. And this kind of setup usually likes to play a flank and play an assassin role, likes to rely on items and uh, like get to the power spikes where you can actually like one shot the backline, like ult flash, do that kind of stuff. But it's very squishy. So you will always rely on like either crown, Zonia, sometimes Banshee, but like these kind of like defensive layers is like utility layers in a way. But the other setup, the tank setup, is better, like a lot weaker early since you don't have as much um, trading potential with it. But once you get like these, these are like for the slower pace game. 
when there's like slower face fights, lower damage. It's it's more like a like it's a semi front line as well, mm -hmm. since since you don't really like ult flash into the back line to like one shot somebody. You ult flash into the back line anyways, but you you will get multiple rotations, get your Ws in, get your ults in, and just be very beefy while also like dealing extreme amounts of damage from the way Kasserin works and that one we will pair with Conqueror most of the time. Sometimes with Rod of Ages, sometimes with Crown. So what makes and a it's... tank bruiser game for Castle? Like when you're going into, you know, a game, why would you go tank bruiser versus assassin, the assassin style? So, so the thing is with tank bruiser, it's it scales a lot better than the assassin style in many many games, because it gives you access to easy tenacity. It gives you a lot of agency, even if you like, as long as you don't fall behind. <clears throat> your damage will be off the roof anyways. And then, like, you just are basically unkillable. You can, like, 1v5 at that point. And that's extremely OP. And and this setup kind of relies on levels and items. If you get behind on, like, tank setup, you will not deal enough damage to one shot. And then you will be also, like, killed. Hmm. So then it's kind of useless. But as long as you don't fall like behind and you can actually play your early game consistently, you will be able to like get to a very very strong mid game, very strong late game, where it actually really outscales the assassin setup as well. So you could kind of go either setup in every game. It doesn't really rely on the cost. Yes, it's just it's just preference at the end of the day. Yeah, at the end of the day, I would recommend anyone that plays Cassidy to one trick one of these setups. Okay. Because I've only ever gotten to Grandmaster or higher one tricking a setup, either the Tank Bruiser or the Assassin. Interesting. Okay, let's move on. So let's get into Cassidy and Keystones. We'll start with First Strike. Walk us through this one, Alados. So First Strike is is a rune that basically allows you to like play a more economy game because it gives you a lot of gold. With your ult ease, you can proc it very consistently. With your uh, like burst damage, it's, it's going to give you great scaling. It actually does the same damage as Electrocute, but to multiple people if you hit multiple people. It's a very good mid to late transition, because once you hit like the two items, three items, you will get like 100, 200 goals for every combo that you do. So that's very strong. And you also get Inspiration Tree, which is giving you a lot of options, both for like if you want to minimize lane better and get a bit better wave clear, you can get demons. You can get free boots. You can get cosmic insight, which gives you more TPs, more ult flashes. Mm. And also, if you want to, you can go futures market and accelerate your economy even more, or even go biscuits if you want to minimize. So, so, so is this is first strike more for the assassin style, or can it be played both the tank bruiser and the assassin style? I would say it's more for the assassin style because the way like. Assassin style works is that you get a lot of AP and AP gives you more gold on the first strike and more damage on the first strike. When we go the tank bruiser setup, we will always go conqueror since that's going to give us basically a flat amount of AP and it's not accelerated by our items as much. Mm. Like electrocute and first strike scale a lot from AP, while conqueror actually just gives you a flat AP so you can be a tank items and not lose a lot of value. So so here on this final comment here, you have inconsistent into certain champs and compositions. What do you mean by that? Yeah, so first strike is one of those, like crown as well, that can be procked off by poking champions, like the Kaisa Ws. Like sometimes you just get hit by Kaisa W and then you're just there like looking and being <laughs> sad about it. Yeah. It's the same thing with like the Zeras, the the Victors, the high range, and even Static Shift is very annoying. True, even Static Shift nowadays with a lot of the LeBlanc Static yeah. Shift, you're probably yeah. never going to be able to proc it, which makes sense. Okay, yeah. Yeah. so then moving on to Electrocute, so a little bit more of a, um, a, an earlier spike, I'm assuming. Yeah, so Electrocute, what Electrocute has is consistency, because you get the trade every single time you hit three abilities, you will get the Electrocute proc. Well, first strike, you have to hit first, and that's not always possible. But Electrocute is very good for snowballing. It gives you a lot of kill potential even early on. Mm. Even pre-6, like, it gives you a lot of damage. It has very good power spikes. Like, once you once you hit your, like, um, Lost Chapter, your Sorks, your whatever, 
it will do insane amount of damage and you will always be able to do it. And it's it's very, very good for single target. It does as much damage as first strike does, but it also gives you domination tree, which is basically the best tree for Kasserin. In domination, you can get sudden impact. You can get like a lot of stuff that gives you like insane amount of value. The only downside of Electrocute is that you, it gets severely outscaled by first strike because it's single target while first strike is gonna do the damage to everyone. Mm. It needs items to scale. So if you if you want to go like any kind of tanky route, it will be lackluster. And also it's a single target. So it's like kind of one use per fight on a squishy or something. And then you don't have it anymore. Right, so, so it just synergizes perfectly with the assassin style, but just you know, really. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And so it has a very clear identity as well, which is good. So yeah. then we have Conqueror, and this is where I'm assuming it comes into that tank bruiser style, right? El Classico, yes. great for extended fights. You know, Synergize is beautiful with the tanky setup because you can yes. be in combat for a lot longer. Um, what would you say are the main weaknesses of Conqueror, though? Well, Conqueror is very weak early in a way that you don't actually get those like spikes of damage. Mm-hmm. You don't actually get to like extend the trade in laning. You cannot, like, you. You don't get the benefit of like getting more gold like first strike does, and you don't get better trades like um, electrocute since Kassarin usually takes the shorter trades. It will not really give you a value in lane. Mm-hmm. It doesn't provide burst, so you can't really like one shot with it unless you actually can one shot without a rune. And you need to stay alive long to actually get the value out of it. Where electrocute first strike, you can ult flash W, like do your damage, kill someone, die. <laughs> Worst case scenario. Mm. With Conqueror, like, you will not get value if you just do that. Okay. So now, you know, you've got here in the top right corner Comet. You know, we weren't initially going to talk about this. What made you want to add Comet in here as well? So Comet is a setup that has been played by many people in higher elo communities. And I don't really want to go into Comet in depth in this guide. But it's also something that allows you to take better, like, poking trades. Especially, you know, like, there are the trades when you can just, like, EQ, like, walk up, EQ, and ult away. Mm. Like, the it it gives you a lot of laning power against those champions where you, your only realistic trade opportunity is, like, walking up and, like, queuing or eing the target. It's more like um, using offense as a defense kind of right. setup. Right, so a little bit more lane-centric, obviously less scaling. And it yeah. synergizes yeah. a little bit with the E as well, because you get the slow, and it'll probably increase the lane yeah. of the yeah. comment. So, yeah, we probably won't talk about it too much with this guy, but it's just worth mentioning. Yes, right. yes. So let's get into the details here. So we're starting off with the Conqueror page. You know, it looks like yes. you know, the Conqueror, I mean, this looks pretty straightforward. We're always going to be taking any presence of mind, Cassidy and Lost presence of mind. Legend Tenacity is the only one you can really use there anyway. Coup de Gras or relatively straightforward. So you've got two options here in terms of secondary. We've got Domination with, with um, Sudden Impact and Genius. Now walk us through the options here in both of these. Okay, so first off, um, Ingenious Hunter, Usually you will take Crown with the Conqueror setup. And Crown actually benefits a lot. That's why we take Coup de Gras and not Last End. Is because we will be full head for most of the fights. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And then Sudden Impact is just the most damage. It's it's very good. Uh, Taste of Blood is fine, but we will not really need it if if we just play well enough. And then like Ingenious Hunter gives us a lot of value through both like the Crown cooldown, the Seraph cooldown, if we buy Zonia, the Zonia cooldown, the tier stacking, the sweepers, and wow. like that's a that's already that. enough for <laughs> for it to get a lot of value, yeah. Yeah. And so how Ultimate you... Hunter is an option. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go on. Yeah, yeah. So Ultimate Hunter is an option. Hmm. That's if you plan on going Road of Ages it might be worth considering since then you get less CD in your initial build. And then like the old hunter will actually like make a difference in your laning phase and early mid to late game. But yeah, okay. that's only when you would actually go out of ages. So I'm assuming as well, if you were to go roller, you would definitely go the ability haste here as well, rather than the attack speed of the AP. Yeah. yeah. And how do you determine between so, the attack speed and the, and the ability haste here? I mean, the uh, AP. So, 
yeah, I would generally go with the Conqueror setup. I would almost always go CD. There is a there is an argument to be made for attack speed, especially when you play like these melee matchups where you can actually take a fight, like the uh, more like these AP champs, like Echo, Silas, these kind of champs, where you would like extend your fight a bit. A AP is fine as well. It makes you do more damage, but I would generally just like like just go back to CDR as much as I can. The more important is the second one actually, where you can choose between AP uh, armor or magic resist. In easy matchups, you can choose the AP. I think that's completely fine. But I think in harder matchups, it gives a lot of value to actually go a defensive route, like uh, armor or magic resist. And the third one is obviously HP. That's going to be very good, especially since we will build Abyssum as later on. That HP actually gives us spend later, so we want to get that HP. Hmm. Okay. So in what scenarios are you going to be taking secondary resolve? So secondary resolve is like there's two ways you can take it. You can take it to like minimize better, which is when you would go the bomb plating into like stuff like the Pantheon, stuff like the Tristana maybe. Uh it helps you a lot. Either bomb plating or second wind can help you a lot surviving laning phase. And conditioning is more like a scaling setup. I would take conditioning if I'm against like a full AD comp. Because then just having like my armor inf like multiplied by a number would be extremely right. valuable. More HP, obviously better when you're getting a lot of yeah. resistance. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where yeah, you get a lot exactly. of value from going the armor, armor shard, HP, tank build. That all kind of builds to, go yeah. to be an absolute nuisance. Okay, beautiful. So moving on to Electro. So it looks like, again, similar to what you said before, Sudden Impact versus Taste of Blood. I'm assuming if you're playing well yeah. and you know how to manage waves and, and, and take trades well, you're probably not going to need Taste of Blood. So if, if you can get away yeah. with Sudden, um, sudden Impact... The thing is, better. my philosophy on Taste of Blood is that what, like, how many more minions will Taste of Blood allow you to take? Probably like 5 to 10. Hmm. Sudden Impact is kind of like a 5 to 10% damage multiplier. I don't think I would rather give up five to ten minions than give up sudden impact. Especially honestly. with electrocute, because electrocute you're, you want yeah, to go for those level yeah. six trades as well, which makes a ton of sense. Like you want to hit that one shot threshold, exactly. and if you don't hit it, like you're doomed. So you yeah. have to get there. Makes total sense. And then you've also got um, what is this? Uh, zombie ward versus eyeball collector. Yes. So how do you determine between these? So zombie ward is a bit of a niche thing. You can, uh, I, I would say you can go eyeball collection and that's completely fine every game. But if you want to do that, you can actually start sweeper and go zombie ward and like get those, like get control for your bot lane before they ward like level one. You can walk there, you can get like a lot of wards. That also allows you to like take basically roams to just clear wards in the mid game. With your ult, you're very mobile. So then you can get a lot of value from that. And this is Although recently, you're not going to need ward as well in lane a lot of the time anyway, right? Because you're just going to be... You cannot ward. really get a ward, yeah. 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 Like you're being pushed in almost or every time, so... Yeah. Okay. And um, last row we... Sorry, go on. Yeah, so last row we have the Treasure Hunter. Obviously, Treasure Hunter will help us hit those spikes. And since we're playing Electrocute, we will probably be looking to snowball in some way, shape, or form. So the Treasure Hunter is very good for snowballing. Then we have Ingenious, obviously, if we go the Crown setup, and we go like Crown, Seraph, Sonya, Rabadon, that kind of stuff, then it's going to be very valuable. And Ultimate Hunter is also fine. If you feel like you you will go like either Ludens or like Roa for some reason. I don't really like Roa with Electrocute, but there are some people that like it, so that if you go raw, I would go Ultimate Hunter. Hmm. Okay, and so moving into uh, Precision Tree, Presence of Mind, no-brainer. Is there ever a scenario where you don't take Presence of Mind? So with Presence of Mind, there is a, a case to be made for Triumph. There was a Chinese one trick that was like a thousand LP that went Triumph with uh, last and every game with this setup. So that was interesting to see. There is a case for triumph when you don't actually like when you don't when you feel like you will not need like a lot of mana sustain. Your W will usually be enough, by the way. It's just more like a reset kind of thing. 
and for that like triumph will actually help you a bit to like um get your health not die to like the close one we once getting ignited that kind of stuff gives you a lot of gold as well if you snowball so that could be made a case for i do prefer going presence of mind every game i just felt like i need to mention it and then yeah we can take either tenacity i would always take the presence of mind and then next to that i would take either tenacity or less than most of the time if you plan on going crown i would take uh kuda crown if you plan on going ludens i would go last and because last and since on Kasterin, you can actually choose when you do all your damage you can do it in one second you can wait for yourself to be a bit lower on hp and then do your entire damage and it will all be influenced by the last stand against Kudagra, which is like you can do your full combo anytime but only like the last 40 percent of it will be actually influenced by the damage increase and i'm assuming a similar uh a similar yeah. mindset here on the bottom row as well but maybe yeah. emphasizing the double ap more because you're going electro and you want to upfront that yes. damage for level six yeah so you want to like into that check. identity right it's all the stat check again yeah. why we're probably yeah. emphasizing the sudden impact why we, we're probably emphasizing the double ap so it all ties into the underlying identity of the page which makes sense and then again yes. niche setups here similar similar to what we mentioned before harder matchups yeah. You, know, you might want to be considering a second wind or a bone plating conditioning if you can get away with it. But to be honest, you know, from, from everything that you've said so far, it sounds to me like you probably want to avoid this if you can, like if, unless you yeah. really need to, right? Um, yeah, it's like the very close combat, like we're going to fist fight to death kind of matchups. Like right. the, the Pantheon is a very good one where you, like if you take bone plating, it makes your life a lot easier. Right. That makes total sense. And then you actually got inspo secondary here. So walk us through this. So that's my actual like that's my actual favorite setup for uh, electrocute because it gives you so much uh, like utility. If you go ignite especially, it's like insane. But that's more like a setup when I would actually take that more with the zombie board kind of stuff. Because that allows you to first off get a lot of gold from futures market, hit your spikes even earlier. Mm -hmm. I would pair that probably with uh, Treasure Hunter as well. And then you get the Cosmic Insight, which will make your ult flashes more common. It will make your Ignite more like more common as well. And it also gives you item haste, which will make your like either Ludens or whatever you take like a lot more OP as well. Interesting. If you pair also the Ingenious Hunter with Cosmic, you can actually get a lot of sweepers. So that's also a good stuff. Fascinating. Okay, and then the, then we have the first strike page. Um, so a little bit more scaling, right? A little bit less damage early game, yep. a bit more econ, um, which makes sense again. Magical footwear, you're really trying to be f pretty gr full greedy mode here. Futures market to offset that a little bit, I'm assuming. You've also got DMATs and biscuits. So how do you determine between this row here specifically? Yeah, so I would say there are matchups. You know, when you get pushed in, Every single time there's like basically a few options. You either like get strong enough or like trade a bit next to your tower where you're safe for you to be able to build a big wave that you can actually crash onto like basically anyone. Or you will want to like get hit inside of the wave so the wave bounces back to you again. That's the most common like how we deal with the bounce. Now, in some cases, DMAT will actually help you get through that bounce phase where it's like, Okay, I need to get this wave out. I can deem at a cannon and maybe like take a reset. I can maybe like help myself push that extra like one minion. It's like an oh shit with the demon. In a, in a yeah. Way. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, yeah, how do we survive that phase? It's demat is a good one answer. And also demat helps you if you deem at a caster, you can one shot the casters from the moment you level W with one auto attack without w without anything under tower with just, so that helps with a just lot. one with just one demon yeah like yeah that. one demon on the casters from level one you can demon the caster i mean not level one obviously when yeah. demon comes up you can demon the caster and if you're getting pushed in you can one auto attack the casters which might help a lot interesting and, and biscuit assuming, delivery is i was yeah, gonna say it's, it's like similar me. right it's like it's like kind of like an another oh shit mechanism it's like okay i want to wait to yeah, minimize yeah. the harder matchup still without having to yeah, go into secondary yeah. resolve yeah i would not really go biscuits i would just like i had a time when i did go biscuits 
and I hit GM for tricking this setup basically. So that at that point I was like, yeah, I will include biscuits. I don't think they are bad, but I would rather take for uh, futures or the demons. Okay, and then rounding and, this one out, you hear, I mean, Cosmic, it makes sense, kind of what you said before, reducing everything, yeah. like Crown, et cetera. And then you've got, same thing, sudden impact, ingenious for the similar reasons. Very, again, more upfront damage, again, very, uh, yeah. the double AP really emphasizing the burst. And yeah, then, yeah, yeah. And then similar reasons here with the second resolve in the heart. Yeah, of the exactly, game. exactly. Any other comments before we move on? Yeah, I mean, only that we want to maximize the damage, so we get most amount of gold from first strike. So in this setup, you usually want to like be a bit more greedy with your itemization as well, like front loading it with damage a bit more. But yeah, that's that's all. Okay, moving on to summoners, we've got TP ignite. Any any major things that you'd like to talk about here? Yeah, so I would say you can one trick TP. You cannot one trick ignite. I would also say that you can always take TP and be fine with it. But if you play like a very volatile matchup where you feel like you need to go like that extra damage or you need the heal reduction from it and you can actually get a very good reset regardless, you can actually go Ignite. So that's that's a more like a 2v2, 1v1 kind of rune that will help you in the early game, help you get those like stat checks. But it will like rob you from your free reset, which is which can be very painful. If you lose like that, like you will be in for a good one. <laughs> well, this is something we're going to be talking a lot about is the reset. So yeah. that will make sense later on, I think, as yeah. we tie things together. One question, though. What do you consider the volatile matchups? What are some examples of volatile matchups? So let's say the Kiana matchup, right? If you're playing into Kiana, most of, uh, until the recent like D-Shield first strike kind of setup, it was very like Kiana would go electrocute, ignite, flash, and just basically all in on her identity of like killing Cassadin, right? In those matchups, you actually play an assassin versus assassin matchups where if you trade like even slightly, you will both be in like kill range of the other. So in those matchups, this really can make the difference because you kind of do equal amount of damage. So you just have to play it very well and at that point, Ignite can be a big difference maker. Okay, beautiful. Get into the spicy stuff. This is for the Assassin build. This is when you're predominantly going either Electrocute or First Strike. So let's just start starting yes. items. We've got Dark Seal and D-Shield. Walk us through this one. So Dark Seal is the like stock standard thing. Like you would go Dark Seal in 90% of the games, I think. I think like... Either with refillable or three potions, depending on how difficult the matchup is. Mm -hmm. Going Dark Seal allows you to hit your wave clear spikes a lot earlier. It allows you to snowball a lot better if you actually get any kind of lead. It also gives you like a lot of value. So it's just it's just a good all round item. D shield is very good if you have to minimize and if you need that extra health to like either not get dived or like not get completely pushed out of lane. But this will all tie, like we will tie this together as well with when we talk about the resets, because that's going to be a big major like influencer of this. Then we got obviously first base. We want to get tier as soon as possible. We want we want to start this, start stacking it so we can get the seraph. We can get the the mana from it, which is extremely valuable on Castorin since you actually scale damage from mana on your ult, so it will always be very very strong. Then we build into either Ludens or Crown. You can go Rod of Ages as well, technically. I would not recommend it, but you can definitely do that one too. But Assassin setups are usually a, mod, a lot more like front-loaded. You will get a lot more damage early on. You will play it for that one-two item spikes, for that uh, Sorg, Seraph kind of setup. And then you will try to one-shot. Going Rod of Ages, does not align with that identity in my mind. It doesn't mind. really make so, sense in my opinion, Rowe. Yeah, like yeah. I mean, Rowe would make more sense in my mind maybe with even like the Conqueror setup. But in my mind, it doesn't really make too much sense with this Assassin setup. But yeah, what's interesting, yeah. you know, when we started working together and, and you, you know, you were doing a lot of Crown and, you know, I think you kind of turned me onto that whole, you know, Church of, yeah, church of yeah. Crown. Like I was a big believer on, I loved, because I used to verse a lot of, 
um, a lot of like Chinese Cassidans on my server and they would go Ludens and they would go Electro and they would go Ignite and I found that a very like I guess annoying setup to verse but then when I was watching you play it I'm like holy shit this crown, this crown setup if played well if you know how to use it is an incredibly yeah. reliable mythic and what a lot of people don't understand is that with Ka especially with this uh, iteration of, of Cassidy is that you only need to get that one massive rotation off and that allows you to yeah. get that one massive rotation off without getting one shot because then you can basically get in get your uh, get your reset and then or then get out you know presence of mind prop so it's yeah. an incredibly incredibly good mythic for Cassidy. so this again will make sense as we kind of get into the gameplay clips I think um, yeah, Sorks yeah. obviously makes sense with this with this setup. You know, you want to upfront as much damage as possible. Very burst oriented. Do you always go Seraph second, no matter what? Yes, no matter what. No matter what. Okay. Uh, the thing about like other options is that they don't like they don't do significantly more damage, and they also give you a lot less utility. And since casting damage actually scales from mana, Seraph is just broken. It's like it's just so good. It's really good. And then you've got a bunch of items here. So, so what's your mindset? You know, getting into your third item. How are you determining between these items? So, depending on the game, obviously I can be ahead or behind. I can opt for like offensive or defensive layers, and I just kind of listed all the items that are kind of like uh, in my mind when I get to that stage of the game. Obviously, if I'm like very behind, I definitely want offensive layers. I want to hit that one shot threshold where I'm actually a threatening force. If I go like a, a frozen heart, I would not be able to do my damage. I would just die, and be useless, kind of. So if if I'm a, if I'm like behind, I would definitely go for the rubber on the voice stuff, depending on what's good in the game. If I'm ahead, I can choose more from like defensive options. I like Zonia for this setup because it's kind of in the middle. It's both like an offensive and a defensive option. Abyssal Mask kind of works the same way, but you can only go Abyssal with Crown. If you go Abyssal with Ludens, you're inting. Because <laughs> you don't really get the pen from the health of the Crown the same way from Ludens, since it doesn't give you health. So, yeah. Defensive layers are also like, let's say you're versing a full AD comp. You can go your Frozen Heart, and it will give you a lot of mana, a lot of CDR, and it will keep you alive after like five items. These are all like very late game options, though. Right. Makes then sense. we have elixirs, which is a very interesting one. Hmm. Because I think I actually do prefer going iron elixir with this setup. Because it gives me the tenacity and fixes my survivability issues a lot of the time. Hmm. So that's that's something that I like doing. So move my cam out of the way, my cam was above the elixir there. So we have I elixir of iron and sorcery. So you find for you personally elixir yeah. of iron because you already have a lot of the time a lot of damage yeah. by that point. Yeah. You'd probably don't need the additional damage from the elixir of sorcery anyway yeah. so you're probably better off having the durability to get more r's off in a team fight essentially yeah yeah makes sense but generally like most of the time you would go like zonia third if you're like even or ahead you would go zonia definitely right. if you're behind or like if you have 3600 god you would get rabadon right that's that's about yeah, it. Yeah, because the build path and, of death cap is just so terrible yeah. you would always get it if you can get it but getting it is so difficult yeah, the build yeah. path is just terrible yeah, yeah. But Rabadon Void stuff is like the most insane damage spike you can ever have. So that's very good if you can get it. Also, I would generally upgrade to Magi a lot, since Castadin is one of those gems where as long as you play the game right, mm. it will be very hard for you to die. So you can definitely get those stacks going and you can survive most of the fights. If you have Crown, you have a second rotation. If you have Seraph, you have a third rotation. If you have Zonia, you have like four rotations. Mm before you actually like die it's like very good okay then was there any anything any else of those, before we yeah. move on here anything else before we move on we can move on we can move on okay so this one very similar starting items same starting items straight yeah. into the tier similar I'm, I'm assuming exact same yeah. scenario if you can get away with dark Cell, the better starting item if you get it if you're versus yeah. a hard yeah. bully matchup go the the d shield into tier so now this one we have crown obviously ludens wouldn't make sense with the bruiser build for, that's pretty yeah. self-explanatory. Yeah. So we need some sort of defensive from our our mythic, whether it's Roa or whether it's Crown. So for you personally, what's the contributing factors? Is it pure preference or is there like a reason why you would go Roa over Crown? So there are a few things, right? The first thing that we talked about earlier is like how easy it is to proc your Crown before a fight. 
obviously if the enemy has like like a victor or like a zerat or something that could like completely like either stomp you on a side lane if you have crown and just like proc your crown and then just you don't have sustain you get hit by a oriana qw and you're just out of lane again then the road of ages would provide you that extra like survivability it's more i i would say it's more so for the side lane because this setup relies on going to the side lane and playing that 1v1 a lot mm. stronger since you will itemize in a very defensive way you can like in a long fight a long extended fight actually start check a lot more champions than with the assassin setup mm. so so for that if if raw and that like sustained um dps will give you more value than you would go raw mm. if you feel like crown is better you would go crown but yeah i would either way actually like after lost chapter or after like blasting one or whatever i would go early lucidities most of the time nowadays mm. i really like going lucidities very early it gives a lot of value with your conqueror and everything so that's something i would consider going after my first like ap item mm. ap item we need because then we can actually wave clear with our old ease and stuff mm. if we get lucidity first which i've been doing a lot you don't get your wave clear so you have to be extremely precise with your gameplay if you get lucidity before any ap mm. But so, so, I really like lucidity. So when it boils down to it, Roa versus Crown, it just it really comes down to how effective is that mythic in that particular game. If it's a very easily procced, yes. you probably want to be going Roa. If it's not easily procced, yeah. Crown probably is a little bit more effective. And then look, ultimately here, they both are going to be very effective. It's, I'm assuming there's an element of preference here as well, right? Yeah. All right. So then, if so you're ahead, so if you're ahead, then Crown is a lot better. But yeah. Okay. So then we have um, Boots. You have Iron the Ends versus kind of the, the Tarbies here and the Mercs. Yeah. I'm assuming, again, this is depending on value. If you get insane value from the this Plated Steel Caps, you're going to go that. If you get insane value from the Mercs, and if you can get away with the Iron the Ends, I'm assuming it's the better one, or what's the thought process? I would go like 90% Ionian, and if it's a very niche scenario, let's say I'm versing like a Syndra Fiddlesticks, I would go Mercs. Right. But if I'm not versing a Syndra of Fiddlesticks, then I would generally go for Lucidities. It allows me to trade a lot more. It actually allows me to keep up Conqueror stacks as I keep trading as well. Mm -hmm. And it allows me... So Boots, I view Boots as like as like a tempo cheat in a way, where I can actually walk further down the river before I have to walk back. I can dodge skill shots better. I can get back to lane faster. Like It speeds up my gameplay so much that I just really, really like having it over like... The f even having it over like finished items, honestly. Wait, is that also included on the other build with with like the assassin build? Do you also go sword? Yeah, yeah. Play your mythic. I don't necessarily like swords before mythic as much mm -hmm. because you like on the assassin setup, like getting that one rotation very strong is generally very good. I would also never go swords before like um, lost chapter. Right. On both of those items. But once you get Lost Chapter and you feel like you have 800 gold, and you, like, if you have, were going Ludens, you had, like, Lost Chapter and the uh, Blasting one, and 800 gold on a base, like, you would just go uh, Swords, and that's fine. But generally speaking, I would prefer having the Ludens or the Crown okay. before I have my item. So this one, very similar with the Ceres as the second item, too high value with Cassidy, you have the Abyssal Mask first yep. Frozen Heart, or for obvious reasons, depending on the composition that you're versing. And then... You're actually buying both. Oh, you're actually buying bars. Interesting. Yeah, so so the thing is, both of them are like kind of a defensive and an offensive layer at the same time. Now with Abyssal Mask, it kind of lost value for Castorin with the mana changes on it. And now it doesn't give you the raw passive anymore. But that means that you can actually buy it with raw now. So Abyssal gives you like a lot of flat pen. If you look at the mats, you actually do the same damage with Abyssal Mask. Actually even more damage than you would do with Zonia's. So, like, the magic pen part of it, unless the enemy has, like, 150 magic resist, but at that point, it's, like, basically a defensive layer that gives you a lot of haste, a lot of health, a lot of magic resist, like, insane damage and insane utility layer. Uh, Frozen Heart is the same. It gives you a lot of mana, a lot of CDR, a lot of armor, which is the main part, and it's also, like, both of them are kind of cheap, 
So once you get your like two items back, your uh, crown set up, if you have conqueror and you're not like behind, these items will be enough for you to like kind of survive into any comp and also do a lot of damage with crown. And that's the point when you would pair it. Instead of actually going a last item immediately, you can actually go like the AP elixir before like fights. And then you do so much damage and you survive any fight. And you just like you're alive for like I had fights when I would have like twenty five worlds in a fight, so it's like crazy. So I got a question here. So in terms of ordering, so so you know you said you like to go both. If if there's yeah. a mixed damage composition where like equal parts AD and AP, how do you determine between which one you go first? Well, I would like look at the lowest states and use my threat assessment to identify. Okay. This is the guy, like if they have, let's say, a Syndra mid that's very fat, mm. and they have like four other AD champs, I would probably go Frozen Heart, because then I can go at the Syndra, kill the Syndra, and then like uh, the rest don't do right. damage. Okay, so this is a very high skill cap thing. So this is where it comes into. Yeah, game, you have to use your low states very well. Reading the game, yeah. and then, okay, okay. Um, and then, you know, at that point, you're basically god mode, but then if you have the, the final item choice, you know, um, yeah. pretty self-explanatory minus the cosmic drive. So how do you, how would one determine between cosmic drive and then the others? So there are games when obviously like that, they have very heavy AP threat. I would go force of nature. Randuin is like against like Crete or more AD. Voice of Robodon are also self-explanatory a bit. Cosmic drive is when you don't really use armor or magic resist as like a very good utility layer, then you would just go for the extra ability haste and like the move speed will give you like value. This is against stuff like, let's say if I'm against a vein, mm -hmm. right? Like me getting an extra ult off is a game changer against like having a Randuins or something. Because she will just melt my HP from the true damage. Interesting. And she's probably not building crit anyway, so you're not going to get as much value from the Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Although right. you never know nowadays, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> Beautiful. Moving on to ability identities. So this one, look, I think is relatively straightforward. I think people can kind of read this, but you know, maybe go over one of the key points or then the key points here for people. Um, yeah. So need extra clarification. Yeah. So the Q is basically a target spell. You can always guarantee hit it and it co like causes minion acro. That's something that you have to think about. You can like pull waves with it. It's it's very helpful. You can sometimes kill the enemy and like pull the minion to you and then last hit it. It's it's very good. You can spam it. Kassadin doesn't have mana issues in the laning phase. You can use your W to basically permanently sustain your mana. As long as you're not like using QE and not use W, you will not run out of it. The very important part about Q is that you will have to use Q reactively in so many matchups. AP matchups, you almost always use Q reactively. It's very important to utilize the shield. That's what makes casting AP matchups good. If you don't use your Q reactively, you just like use it, and then you get traded. AP matchups are not good matchups, <laughs> so you need to be using them very well. Uh, the W obviously is very low cooldown, and it gives you back mana, so you should be using it often. It's an auto attack reset. It gives you a bit of an auto attack range as well which helps with farming a lot. So you can basically use your W to farm whenever you want to farm with it. The only exception is when you're like bouncing a wave and you have to be like very strong. And like, if you use your W, the enemy would have like a trade window, then you would actually keep the W, but otherwise you can just use it. And it does a lot of damage. Like auto Ws will do a lot of damage on Kassarin. So our problem is not damage in the early game. It's actually like gap close, right? And then we have the E, which is the main wave clear and skirmish tool. And that's why we will always max E first. Sometimes putting us some points into Q into the AP matchups where you would use it reactively to minimize. But otherwise, you would not really max Q. You would max E almost every game. It's so much value you get from maxing E that it's just insane. It also does a lot of AOE damage. So like this, this will make it so that when you max E and you like E ult, the wave is gone. You can move, you can actually skirmish. Your E will be back so much faster. You can use it multiple times in fights or even like 1v1 skirmishes, whatever. And it's it's just going to go absolutely crazy. 
And the slow is the only utility that Castorin actually has in his kit, other than <laughs> the queue, like uh, canceling a channel, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot so, of utility. <laughs> that's a lot. Oh, it is a lot. It is insane, but yeah. And obviously, the ult is broken by concepts. Shout out broken by um, concepts. Podcast. Shout out broken by concepts. <laughs> the best. And yeah, um, the ult makes you actually a champion. You can actually now close the gap and do your damage. So that's a very good thing. But the ult early on especially is extremely committal. If you ult, you don't have an ult for six seconds. And people tend to ult in. Then they ult in, they die. <laughs> so... You have to be very mindful of your ult. Oftentimes, your ult also has to be used reactively, but that's not only against AP matchups. That's against any matchup. You you can use your ult for so many things. We will talk about that later. But the ult is very strong if you use it reactively. And uh, obviously, it has the best terrain scaling in the game. Like you can freely jump over anything. Basically, you can basically freely like cross around the map. Um, look for picks, go around fog and everything. It's very, very strong. And the damage scales from AP and mana and the stacks, obviously, but it also will make it very expensive. So you have to kind of master the art of like using ult. But we will talk all about all of that later. All right, so we're getting into the main Cassidy and combos. We're going to keep it simple with the auto W. I think this one's relatively straightforward, kind of as Alados was mentioning before. Yep. The auto attack cancel, very important for damage in general so something you need to master over time and then we have the first major combo which is the ieq combo good for poke this is something like you were mentioning before about you know poking into mages or you can kind of use it reactively to certain champions that have cc yeah. like a syndra kind of ring over a syndra combo any other scenarios where you would use this combo i would use it a lot into when i'm like you know when you have a wave on your side and it's kind of freezing and you want to transition it into like a slow build, I would generally get one or two of these combos mm -hmm. while also getting my ult from like 40 mana to like 80 the next time. I use the combo again, 160. And suddenly my ult is like very strong because I stacked it up while also trading. And my enemy is a bit lower now on HP. And then when the wave is actually crashing, I already have my ult stacks ready. I have the enemy's HP ready for a dive. So ah. that's the main like yeah, okay. that makes use sense. scenario. Yeah. And then we have the uh, burst combo, the QR auto WE. So this is kind of like the, you know, you're coming out of a bush or someone's face checking you, right? Something yeah, like that. Yeah. So how would you, th how would you view using this one? Yeah. So this obviously, since you don't use E early in the combo, you don't get a lot of value from the cooldown reduction of it, but it does the most like DPS in a short term. So this is the highest like burst damage combo in a way. Like if you, if the people cannot escape it, this is going to be like one-shotting them the fastest with the le least reaction time, right? Right. So Makes sense. That are auto attack. So walk us through this one. So, so yeah, you see like when you use it, like slowly, as you saw on the first like two clips, it's like uh, very slow. Like if yeah. you... Okay, let's go back here. So it's... Sorry. Yeah, so, so some of them are slower. So yeah, so that was really slow. Like, like if you if you auto attack and ult in, mm. the auto attack will come off very slowly. Mm. But you can actually, as you arrive with, with the ult, as the like small bar is over, mm. the cast time of the ult. Ah, it's like you you see, like this auto attack will be very fast. Right. That's right. why you always have to do an auto attack command when you ult in. Ah, interesting. So would you a click or something? Yeah, I would click on the target or A click, yeah, okay. every single time. Interesting. You can even A click multiple times because you will need it. Like, trust me, if you don't have this, like, down path, like, this will hurt you the most, like, not knowing this. Yeah, this is actually really big. Because, again, all the all those little bits of damage add up, right? And one missed auto yeah. can be the difference between you getting, you know, your presence of mind proc. Yeah, or, like, between you getting, like, those one shots, especially on the assassin setup, like... That's a hundred damage. Like you don't want to miss that. Mm. It's it's insane, right? We obviously have the R flash where we would have to like hover over the target with the R, and then use flash. You see, if like if I R like where I'm like Ring, I actually showed it. Mm. It will always go towards the cursor when you cast the ult. Mm. So now I cast it within my range. You see, it's like 
there. Ah. I cannot wood flash like that. It will always go to the point where I'm Ring. Ah, so yeah. that's why you want to R over the dummy hmm. and then flash. Hmm. Interesting. And then we have the so e this is obviously off. Yeah, so you can E flash as well as R flash, which works in the same way. This was by the way a thousand epic game. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, pretty straightforward, and that's going to catch a lot of people guard. And again, a yeah. very bread and butter combo, especially when you are looking yeah. to solo kill people in lane. Very, very, very yeah. important. We'll look at it one more yeah. time. E flash R. R flash E W Q. So this looks like a very important, more mid game centric skirmish oriented setup here. I mean, uh, yeah. So yeah. So R E like R flash E will give you like the most amount of like. The E works the same way as the auto attack. You, you can like use the E, but you can actually buffer the E and it will come out very fast, while the auto attack doesn't come out very fast. So mm -hmm. you can R flash E and it will be like the least like reactable because then they are slowed for your auto W or whatever you want to use and then for your Q and whatever. Mm -hmm. And here I have electrocute as well, so I can just use my Q to like finish the one shot. Now we have this one. This is the R E auto W Q. So so this for so this one here R E or so this one is is very good right because you're getting the E earlier on in the trade to lower the cooldown yeah. in the fight as well. Yeah. So this is you know if you can go for this trade, it's probably going to be a lot more effective. And not to mention you get the slow early on in the combo with E, which can allow you to stick on top yeah. for the auto W as well, which is quite important. So in what scenarios are you kind of going for this trade? So I'm going to go for this anytime that I can like actually land an E on my opponent. I mean, on what's on my opponent. Because in lane, this is going to be your highest damage burst combo. Your Q at the end is actually very good because it will block like any damage on the back end. And, and like by the time like you're done with the combo, you will not have your ult back up, but you can actually auto attack again and then you get another rotation and then it can be very, very threatening into many champions. So, Although, also you would be very the, careful. The benefit of this combo comparatively to the one where you start with Q, you know how the burst combo where you come out of the bush before. The benefit of this one is yeah. that, I mean, two parts. Number one, you're getting your E down earlier such that they're slowed yeah. rather than at the end of the combo so you can actually stick on top of them. And then number two, you're getting your E early in the combo which allows the cooldown to be reduced as well. Yeah. Right. And another thing... Your Q can be flashed, like your E can be actually flashed, or like you can flash away from it. Right. Well, if you use it early in the combo, your Q will actually follow the targets even if they flash away. Right, that makes sense. Right, that's that's the risk. That's why the other one, the other best yeah. one is like, if they're face checking you, you know 100% you're going to get all your damage off and have no mobility essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Right, makes sense. All right, so moving on to early laning goals. So we've got, these are kind of, correct me if I'm wrong, kind of like general holistic goals that for the most part that you can follow at, at, to kind of give you some sort of direction in your games, right? So we've kind of got basic things like maximizing CS, trying to get to level six. How do you think yeah. of these in your own games? And, and is this for people of all ELO brackets or, or how, 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 how are you viewing this one? I would say this is like general, like guidelines for the early game. This is your, like what your mindset should be is like, I want to maximize my CS at all. I want to reach my level six safely. I want to stay alive, stay as healthy as possible so I don't get dived. The game is not played around me if I'm not that low. I want to keep my flesh. That's very, very important. Many people lose flesh pre six. Bad. Sometimes you should die and not lose flesh. Uh, and obviously, having the best recall possible before level six is absolutely massive. So the later you can recall without losing minions, obviously, the better. And that's why we will need the TP. Beautiful. And so this is not only just for beginners, this is actually just for all ranks, really, just at a high level, kind yeah, of general yeah, overarching yeah. things. Oh, I like it. So these are, again, more general rules we can follow. So you want to go through these kind of one by one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So early game, try using every single moment of opportunity to put yourself into a better position. This means everything. Like if your opponent roams, you fix the wave. You don't go, you fix the wave. You just stay in lane and do your wave the best. Like five seconds of time can make a difference. Two seconds of time can make a difference. If your enemy goes for a ward when the wave is crashing, you will be there thinning it with your everything. Like you will just go there and like do whatever it takes. You will 
also have to like position well in the lane to like, let's say the enemy will want to use a spell on you, like Zerat is charging the Q. What do you want to do with the wave? If you want it to push into you, you will stand in the wave. If you don't, you will stand outside of the wave. So he has to make a choice. All of these things, these little things that you can use as like opportunities, you have to like use them because Kassadin doesn't really have control. You have to take control in different ways, right? Yeah, think about your champion. You have no utility. You need to nothing. Get, you need to get to two items. You you know you basically offer nothing to your team. You have no CC, nothing. So everything that the way your entire mindset needs to be needs to be inherently selfish. So every little thing that's that you know from watching your vods in, in the MLA and we, we do our sessions comparatively to lower elo casadins. The, the main difference, I mean, outside of just over uh, like understanding your limits and your damage output, it's just all these little things. Like every little yeah. thing you do in lane makes sense. It's like, okay, yeah, he's standing inside the wave to get the wave into him. Or he's queuing the enemy to get minion aggro so that the wave comes into him. Or whatever the hell yeah. it might be. Like yeah. every little thing makes sense. That is, if you want to be a great caster and player, you've got to take every single little moment. That is something you fundamentally got to internalize. And this ties into the second point beautifully. You got to get, you got to be greedy. You're going to have to be greedy yep. every little moment to fix your wave state, to get a better reset, to get two items. Whether you have to give that objective, you have to give that rift, you have to give that dragon, you have to say no to that two between the river. This is the overarching mindset that we really got to try and get across. Even more important that like, I want to like mention is that many, many, many times, like 90% of the times you will ping off the ganks. You will ping off everything. You just want to play your little isolated farming game <laughs> most of the time. Like that's a very important skill for casting. You have to be able to tell people that you want to play alone <laughs> in a way. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, that is a skill in itself. The ability to ping off a gank and say no to a gank is huge. And a lot yeah. of people struggle with that. Yeah. Um, unless you can kill enemies effectively, you're a hungry man and your team has the plague. So walk us through this one. What do you mean by this? Yeah. So, so like there are points when you have your spikes, you can fight. You're like very strong, right? If you can do that, you want to not fight. Like you don't want to ever compensate on caster. And it's the worst thing that you can do. Many champs can go for like, uh, helping their team, like holding their hands, like being very nice with them in the mid lane, like just pushing waves out together, hovering, doing that kind of stuff. Sometimes you can do it on Kassarin. But most of the time, if you're not strong enough to actually take a like, head-on fight, you will go bot lane, you will side lane, you will go top lane, you will side lane, you will... Like, you will think of your team with the plague mindset. They have the plague, you want to avoid them. You want to be as far, getting your solo XP, solo gold, drawing pressure as much as you can against like not drawing pressure. Like you still have to influence the game in some ways. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you just can avoid them and not do anything, right? You have to like draw pressure. You have to eat your minions, eat your plates, eat your towers, whatever you can get, right? But yeah, this is a generically good mindset to have. And keeping the wave on your side. You know, this is something we'll get into in a moment, really getting into the clips, but this is going to make it easier for you to farm. It's going to make it easier for you to not die to ganks. It's going to make it easier yeah. for you to prep waves to get a better quality reset. It's going to make everything yeah. easier, relatively straightforward. Again, early tier, love it, clear reference point. Get Sweeper as soon as possible. Um, so, yeah, Sweeper, how do you view Sweeper, like, overall with Cassidy? So, Sweeper is a tool that you get when you escape lane. That's a, I'm gonna get like I'm gonna say escape lane a lot because uh, that's the moment when you can actually like have enough wave clear, have enough pressure that you can actually like start roaming around the map or like go for plays or go for objectives, go for picks, whatever. That's when you want to get your sweeper. That's when you want to get optimally your boots, your uh, tier two boots. That's when you actually want to like start playing more for the game and less for yourself, mm. as in like for your lane. But you would still always highly value your waves. Like, you will never see me roam and lose a play. Mm. It's just not happening. Mm. And you will not see, like, high low caster in student. Mm. And then max E, then W, then Q. Put as many points in Q as you need to make AP match of title, which was what you were referring to early on. If you need to put two or three points in your Q into a really hard AP matchup because they're bullying you, you know, something like that, then it is what it is. But ideally... 
right? You want to avoid doing that as much as you can because all of your damage is yeah. really going to come from that E, which is pretty self-explanatory. Yeah. And this is also like, you really need the Q reactive usage to make use of Q points. So please do. And then take yeah. those free resets. Yeah. Resets are so incredibly hard to get on Kasserin that as long as you can get a good reset, that's game winning play. It's like insanely huge, right? Every good reset is going to increase the likelihood of winning a game by like 10%, 100%. At least. At minimum. So we're going to be diving into an example of an early lane to try and get across some of the points that we've been talking about so far in this guide. Now, we initially were going to go through one of Alados's early lanes, but Alados stumbled across this Chovy early lane of him playing Cassidy. Now, believe it or not, you know, Cassidy, the, you know, the prodigy, he's incredibly good in the early lane with his Cassidy. So we're going to walk through this. Alados is going to step us through what are some of the things that we need to be looking, looking for in our early lane and what makes a beautiful early lane with Cassidy. As you can see, he has a he has a spellbook set up. I'm not going to go too in-depth about it, but he has D shield, which is the one that's very important here. As you can see, he's not using his Q. He's not doing anything with the wave. He's just letting it push to him, and he's actually walking up to auto attack. See? Absolutely beautiful. Like, last hitting with auto attacks, waiting for the like reactive Q usage. Mm -hmm. You see? Ah. And now Ari uses the W, and you see the reactive Q usage. That's beautiful. very important. It also pulls the minion where he can actually like farm it safely. Very important. Now you will see this through the rest of the laning phase as well. He gets auto attack to make the Ari aggro the minions. And, and he sent it the inside. Yeah, exactly. So And now Ari cannot actually three stack. He mistimed the Q a bit there, but that's that's going to happen. I can guarantee it's going to happen to everyone. I just want to go so... back here. What you said is that because he's actually baited the Ari to use abilities here, like you said, Ari yeah. can't go for a three stack anymore. He has to go. She has to go for a two stack, which actually makes a yeah. hell of a lot of difference in terms of CSing on the tower. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he messed up that Q there, but you can see the intention. Yeah. Yeah. Now the first minion he obviously can't get. Second one will be like auto walk away W. And under tower, it's very important to minimize your time that you spend near the minions. It's very important. As you can see, like, can you go back a bit? You see, like, he's going to go to the minions and look at how many minions he takes in like two auto attack times of Ari. Like, mm -hmm. he got auto attack three times and he took like five minions. That's the difference. If you walk up for every minion, like one for one as auto attacks, like he would be out of lane. You're gonna take too much damage, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And now we arrived at the point where the wave kind of bounces, where he gets auto attacked a bit, but he actually like got damaged, so he he made the wave bounce back to him. That Q from Ari actually already achieved that for him, that the wave will come back to him again, which is great. That he can use to minimize more, get like more pressure off using the Q reactively. Yeah. And these trades, like when he walks up for an auto attack, those are actually good trades because the Ari takes so much minion aggro mm. that she will actually lose so much health. Mm. Uses the Dima to pick up minions under tower. That's a very good use of the Dima as well. Oftentimes you will not need the Dima to like actually get a minion type extra damage or do that kind of stuff. So. You can kind of use them freely. Mm. You see, like, he demoted that caster as well, that he couldn't get otherwise. And now, since Ari is kind of out of mana, we used our D-Shield very well. You saw he actually kept the potion for very, very, very long. He actually, like, you don't want to use your potion unless you actually want to, like, use the extra head, since D-Shield will give you more rage and the lower you are. Mm. But now the wave crashes again. Now we will look to actually like get a good reset soon. So I'm assuming what he will do is just hit the wave with everything. E on as many minions as possible. Get the W off for this maximum damage. This is the damage. most dangerous part of a Cassidy lane. When that wave starts bouncing out and they come back with that TP, you want to do everything you can to try and prevent that freeze. Yeah, and now since... It, do it doesn't even matter a lot if there's a freeze at this point, because it's not the third wave that bounces out, but more like the sixth or seventh wave. So now at this moment, we can already see that 
like we have such a big wave fleet and we have the issue Ari can't really like take a trade onto us. Mm. If she tries auto attacking, she will get minion aggroed and basically murder then then we just go back to base, just TP back and we're And he also completely knew where was the Z jungle. The Z jungle had shown on bot side here, so he knew that he yeah. could actually safely walk up and actually get the wave out, which is very yeah. really important. Yeah. So he gets the race Now we got the base. He has 40 CS at five minutes. Absolutely insane. We hit the tier, the amp tome, very stock standard. And now once we have the ult, we can start looking for trades. That's when we will like want to look at ult usage, how we use ults like reactively, how we use ults like actively if we have to. And and pretty good stuff. You can also see that he actually traded health before he TP'd back. So that gives him a way better like lane tendency at this point, mm -hmm. which is very good. Wave's in a really good position now as well. He's going to have to wait yeah. on the side. He's finding those windows yeah. to thin the wave whenever he can as well, so he can, he yeah. can minimize yeah. the amount of creeps he has to see us under the tower. You can ult, or like even just out at the W. Be interested to see how he takes the trades post six now. Using minions to block the charm. Yeah, now he can, mm. you see, like, Ari charmed. That's a window of opportunity to go for those old EQ trades that we yeah, talked about earlier. We spoke about there, the basic combos, the R, E, Q, short trade. Another thing that uh, many people don't notice on this is that he actually ulted the wave and hit the E with everything. Mm -hmm. You see, this is a very important concept as well. You can actually wave clear at the same time as trading with Castellin, if you do this kind of trade. And this is very, very important. This is incredibly important because this is going to give him like a lot more health because he doesn't have to see us under tower. This gives him like lane priority and it gives him like a good opportunity to like place a board or something. Mm -hmm. Also something to mention, he has Ignite now because he has Spellbook. Mm -hmm. So now he actually like is a lot more threatening than what we see on the screen mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. I would not recommend going Spellbook for anyone that's trying to pick up Castorin. It's a very niche setup, and it's not going to be very good in many games. We'll fast forward a little bit here. This is, again, now he's got his lost chapter. We'll see how he kind of takes trades post around level 7 here. Yeah, so at this moment, he will look at the, like, reactively EQing, using the Q reactive to the REW. Very good. I mean, if you're heading into, it's, you know, eight minutes with 81 CS, you're in a very, very, very... Yeah, position. like, that's auto win. Like, I cannot lose. <laughs> He's still trying to bait out abilities. Use the Q, ult away, hmm. reactively to the charm. Our ult has a way lower cooldown. You can see his tethering is absolutely beautiful. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, a lot that, this was actually really big here, by the way. The baiting out of the charm right here gave him the trade window after because he baited out that charm right yeah. now. Now he has the ability to R aggressively to get his E off. Because yeah. Ari, Ari would otherwise tether, <clears throat> tether that E, so he has to actually use his R to get in range to actually use that trade. And also, notice how what you say, he did what you said before, which was use the R on the wave, and actually actually finished off that minion. Look at this. He went, he went for the yeah, trade. Yeah, it was two minions, finished off. And then E, e. and then got that one with the auto W. With an auto W, and he can walk away without yeah. being like, realistically threatened. All the small things. And that's, that's why he's able to yeah. fundamentally keep his farm up to such a high level. You know, yeah. and, and then I think that's really the main parts of this early lane that we wanted to cover here anyway, the first yeah. one to eight. So again, that's what a stock standard, I mean, not even a stock standard, that's a very, very solid That's a lane. pinnacle, pinnacle that's of custody. That's what we're aiming for. <laughs> All right, so we're going to contrast uh, Chovy's early lane gameplay with Alados. Um, this one, he's versing a Syndra Jarvan. I believe this um, this Warwick's actually Broxa, so you've got Broxa on your team yeah, there on the yeah, Warwick. Yeah. Um, you've actually opted in for the Electrocute um set up in the tier start which is a, a, i would say a bit of a greedy setup right <laughs> yeah so in this game this is like i think a six seven hundred rp game uh, i actually went for a setup that i thought at the time this was at like february was the best for a while which was tier start into like actually kind of getting a lost chapter rushing the setups into getting second items and then you get like an extremely good power curve 
you see i'm also not using my uh q to like poke but here at this point like i could do it mm -hmm. i wanted to poke, like uh, get the wave on my side so i'm assuming by standing inside the wave you were trying to stand inside the wave bait out the central q here um yeah yeah i see yeah and also just like like q her to like proc the first strike and then like stand inside the wave but she got a very very good q on me mm. so that was already and here you're purposely taking this damage, right? You're purposely here taking these autos and cues to get the wave coming yeah, back. Yeah, yeah. So right now I have to get autoed. If I don't get autoed, the wave will go to her and that's very, very dangerous, especially into a char one. Yeah. So you're, right now you, you've so, actually recognized, okay, level one, I messed up. The wave was jumping into Syndra. I got yeah, to I have to sacrifice now. that. you got to make a sacrifice. You're, all this is intentional. Again, this is what we've got to really stress yeah. to the viewer right now. This is, Alaros is thinking about wave state. Wave state, wave state, wave state. How do I get the wave on my side? Because when the wave's on your side, it's going to make your entire life easy. Easier. Again, and like the grabbing CS in the queue. Syndra Q also like only has that like small window to punish me. Mm -hmm. Now I recognize that the wave is coming to me, so I'm going to use like every second I can to thin it a bit. Syndra gets the EQ, but the wave is already very fast shopping to me. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be a very good wave state for me. I'm gonna use my Q there so I can get like both the minions. If I auto attack, I lock myself in animation for too long for her Q. But if I walk up with Q for that minion, I can actually get it. Now I'm still like using my W actively to like get minions. I'm gonna use my Q of cooldown as well. I already have used one potion and here I have a way more greedy setup. If I have uh, D shield, I'm full health right now. But since I don't and I, I kind of like playing non D shield games. This is gonna be very good for me. Waves and now I got the cannon. The wave is in a very good spot. And what is very good about this wave is that it delays like her ability to like like the later the wave starts bouncing, the better for me, because the more like minions and everything I get for absolutely free. Mm. So here I'm putting a second point into Q because two points Q will actually one shot the caster. That will give me that extra minion. And also, it's not bad for me to, like, use that Q hmm. or, like, get that Q point in this matchup. And now, like, since I, I kind of faked my recall, she started yes, shoving the wave. Yeah, went out of vision here, faked your recall to, to actually get the Zinger yeah. shoving back into you, which is really smart. Yeah. Yeah, so this way I can get an extra wave and my bounce will get delayed even more. Hmm. And now you, you will just see me, like, thin the wave. I will wait for the minion out there. That way I can actually like one-shot the minion. That's why if you take demons on the casters, you can actually one-shot it. Mm. It's like very close. And now you see, Syndra is roaming. I'm already push, 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 push. Insta push. I'm, I'm gonna get this wave in, no matter what. I'm not gonna TP that I'm not gonna do anything crazy. I'm just gonna fix my wave and be very happy about it and miss the minion. <laughs> I miss the cannon. Oh no. But remember, like, again, I mean, I, I'm gonna get those. selfish, selfish, selfish. <laughs> I need to fix my wave state. Yeah. That is priority number one. Yeah. I so here you see, I went for a Dark Seal and a Ruby Crystal. That was my best base in this position because I'm going for actually a Seraph Rush in this game. But, okay, the itemization is a bit weird in this one. But generally speaking, the the early game principles are still, like, shown here. And now we've nearly reached a free level six. I mean, if you're ever getting a free level six like yeah. this, you know you're in a. I mean, you know you've had a pretty solid early lane. Yeah, I I played the like first few levels. I don't think that very well, hmm. but like Syndra's roam actually allowed me to like get a huge advantage. Hmm. Again, you see, like I'm always gonna ping a lot for my teammates so they don't die to my laner or they. Like, if my laner wastes time on a side lane, that's game winning. It's like significant, extremely good. Mm. And you've actually went for the two points in Q in this game because I'm assuming yeah. you just wanted to minimize some of that damage. And you went a greedy setup as well, which obviously didn't help. Yeah. You probably wouldn't have had to go so, for the two points Q into into the um, into this game if you didn't have Tia start, if you had Doran start. Yeah, I mean, I would still probably go two points into Q. Mm. But I think uh, definitely like one of those matchups where you don't really ever need to go like, like you, you, you can make a choice whether you put two points into Q or start Doran Shield. Hmm. But you get so much more like agency. I mean, not agency. You get so much more like wave clear if you start Dark Seal most of the time. 
in this game, it's it's not a good example of that, but it's a good example of like how you actually use abilities in lane and how and you actually play waves. And what's really key here is because you were able to take that really good reset early, you didn't have to use your TP early on. You now have TP for your second yeah. recall, which is now going to make your, your second base incredibly good. Yeah, so right now I know that, okay, this is going to maybe get a bit scuffed. But this is fine. Like, you're losing caster uh, gold is completely okay. Mm gonna move a bit so she doesn't QE me, but yeah, you see, now I'm getting a very good reset. I get my Kindle drum. Right now, I actually am playing a bit more for the like mid game skirmishes, mm -hmm. less than actually like laning phase. So Kindle drum will give me a lot of health, a lot of like it's what I can afford towards my Seraph in this game. And but was there yeah. any other points about you want to cover in the early lane here? Because now you're level six and we're yeah, yeah. So now we can look at the level six trading and like how it kind of goes. Okay. I don't really want to like contest waves as much. I can just I even put a third point into Q because I want to like heavy trade. Mm, like that. I'm so blocking the damage with the Q. And you see, like I don't even take damage here. I just I just go for the trade, E Q reactive. And she's already like low health, and my wave set is great. I can start looking for those like old EQ trades mm. now to get her HP lower. And if she gives me, obviously, a, an ult range, then I will just take it and be extremely... So here's the weird thing, right? Because think about yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. Mean, if, she, if she respects, the, you're just going to freeze the wave, right? If she doesn't get it... Yeah, I'm just going to do it in XP, exactly. You're free. So like, she, right so now, what she's I'm doing is like... damage for that wave. Yeah, yeah. So she's going for the cannon minion, right? Which she actually lost her flash for. Which you can do like on many minions, right? Like you can punish so many minions. This is my second cannon that I lost this game. And then same thing here, right? We always need to be thinking about wave state. So you have the choice yeah, to make. Yeah. It's the shove or you can hold the wave on your side. Yeah, so right now I don't have a good reset. So I just want to like basically stay in lane, keep the good wave state, value my wave state over my actual reset. Because I don't need a reset right now in any way. I just want to get... Like, I just want to get the most out of my next reset, in a way. Or my current lane. Well, then take Which a look is... at a few more trades here. Wave crashes, we're happy. Yeah. Syndra comes back to lane. This is another important concept. That ult that I just did is very important, because when you... Like, when Vakos arrived there, I obviously can't go. But now, look at my ult. Since Syndra is not in lane, she cannot punish my ult cooldown. So I actually can use my ult mm -hmm. to thin the wave without putting my E on cooldown. Mm -hmm. That's something very important. When you get a second, when the enemy is not in range to punish your ult, you should always start with ult, because your E is a lot less committal for wave clear. Mm -hmm. So that way, you can actually get the ult off. And now, like, you see, Syndra is here. Now I can't do it. If I ult it there, that's actually a missed opportunity by me. I could have done something. Hmm. Again, I, I use my wave clear with my trade as well to get my wave, get a bit of a trade on her. Getting trades on your enemy before recalling is very good because that actually makes them less effective when they try to roll more skirmish. Hmm. Into Syndra is not as significant, but let's say this is a Katarina, right? Like, if I can prevent them from roaming by just taking a good trade, it's so insane for hmm. me. That's like... yeah. So from a tempo perspective. I think that's the major points of this one. I don't think we need to go any deeper in this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Absolutely. I mean, this is very interesting contrast between you and Chovy. Obviously, I think this one was a little bit harder because of the way yeah, the ways yeah. panned out and the RE kind of purpose shoved into the Chovy. So I think it's a really good contrast yeah. to see both regardless. And RE is a lot easier matchup than Syndra. So, like, it's it's night and day. Like, Syndra is one of the hardest AP matchups. Well, Ari is like kind of easy. So we're going to be getting into some of the smaller details. These are the kind of tips and tricks that, you know, Alados has put together. Um, mainly, I believe, uh, revolving around early lane. This first one is talking about starting Q versus E level one. So walk us through the mindset here between starting Q versus E. So, so most of the times, like, there are two things that could happen to your level one. You either, like, dominions will die at the same time or they won't. In this case, they are kind of like dying at the same time, but I mistime my E. So this is a, 
a very bad example of the level one because here, since he started hitting the wave, I should have actually started the the Q and just like walk up for the first one, auto attack. Mm. You or do something need, like right because they're staggered is what you mean so these minions are staggered so you yeah. don't actually need to yeah. start e but if, if if he were not to touch the wave at all and the minions would all be the same hp you could just get away with it and just start e is what you're saying yeah 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 and right. we will have examples for that one too okay. like here i could have just started q and be fine or just get one auto attack from him and then like the minions will re-aggro and then i can actually like kill the minions at yeah. the same time right okay that makes sense but yeah like this is like I lose all the minions. Now this is a different example. And we're like kinda I'm trying to get an auto attack so she pushes faster. Ah, if she so doesn't. You're trying to get into auto attack range, so then she auto attacks you and yeah, then yeah, she pushes yeah. into you. But she doesn't, so I just E to start and then I just get all the minions with yeah. it. Right? Okay. And so and because they're all dying at the same time, you can get away with the E and then yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the wave will probably naturally come to you here anyway. Yeah, yeah, especially into Tristana, like she will, her E will actually auto push the wave if she ever wants to trade into me, like she cannot really freeze. So, yeah. Okay, and then we have leveling W level 2 versus Q level 2. Yeah, so in this scenario, the wave is crashing level 2 already, so I'm gonna just like level W to grab some extra CS, have easier time CSing under tower. As you can see, like I'm getting 90% of the CS like that. If I have Q here, like it would be a lot harder to see as right. all of this. Right. So if you're because my auto attack damage is also reduced. Right. Right. Because the W also is going to act as like an auto attack reset as well, which is gonna yeah, and the passive like auto increase as well. So right, I get a lot more damage. Yeah. So this is when like the wave is gonna crash very late. Mm -hmm. So since I the wave doesn't actually crash level two. I'm gonna have to like start like level Q so I can grab more minions as the wave is on the way to crash. Mm. Ah, okay. So this yeah. is in the scenario where they they're gonna be doing a three stack, not a two stack, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So and this, this is, is the scenario sacrificing team yeah, plates. Yeah. This is the El Clasico <laughs> Cassidy gameplay right here. Yeah, I do this. Like you roam against me, I will take your plates. Your tower is mine. Guys, no, I don't see it just yet. If you first Alados and Solik, you know exactly what it's going to be doing to you if you roam. Yeah, I mean, I get one play, two plays, game is unlosable. Like, I don't see her yet, so I don't want to, like, ruin my wave state completely. But now I see her on top, and now right. I can just right, get so my wave in. Right, so in this scenario, there is no hesitation in your mind. As soon as you see your person, your counterpart roam, there's yeah. no question of whether you're following with TP or following with the roam up the river. Yeah. You're always going to fix the wave state yeah I, I, no no hesitation like i'm not gonna leave my lane in a bad state and this like tristana loses a wave like she's inting right now mm. like this is so so incredibly like at this moment if this happens to me in a game i know my chances of winning are like over 80 <laughs> percent yeah I mean, like, this is so massive if you have casted in mastery 100 percent. yeah I mean, because now, now, like, when she comes back to lane, I have an XP lead. Even if she gets two kills, I have an XP lead because she loses wave. Hmm. So in that sense, I also have the same goal because I get the waves and I get the plates. Hmm. And then, like, by the time she's back in lane, I can just completely stomp. Now, this is a very good one. You see, like, I'm almost about to hit level 6. When I hit it, I, I auto-attack W. I go in. Go in with my... Like, I level level 6 immediately as I go in. This is why you want to, like, get as much XP as possible. And this is what you'd be able to do to the, to the Tristana as well with your level lead. Yeah, exactly. And you see, I move back a bit. Mm. You see that little front step? Mm. Yeah, I make exactly. her flash out. So, yeah, you, so like, what happens here, you threaten the R to chase here, but you just kind yeah, of... Yeah, yeah, So here I just, like, cue her, walk away, walk back. I have my ult up. But I don't have to use it. She will yeah. flash, and I can just do it away yeah. and survive. And, and that changes now my lane's lane. is so extremely good. Yeah, exactly. This is also the thousand up again. Yeah. Okay, so this is kind of what you were talking about before in the combo section, where when the wave is kind of on your side, yeah. you'll fish for these trades, and then the AOE yeah. the wave, and then yeah. you'll start a slow build, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So now... Like, she's already set up for, like, a good wave. But now the wave is still on my side, so she has to actually walk up, use abilities to last hit, because she's always threatened. Mm -hmm. 
mm. right? And now she uses that, which is kind of a mistake. I emote on her losing the cannon, obviously. The be happy has to <laughs> has to be there. Mental warfare. Yeah, exactly. Now we just got the EQ traits. I'm trying to sidestep that, but I can't. And now, like she's already set up for being dived. Mm. I'm That's still probably... waiting for an extra like bit of time to like just. And this is that trading pattern here that, again, the non-committal. This is the I. You're not using the R for the R damage. You're using it for the gap close yeah. to the E. The EQ. The yeah, EQ. because she doesn't like if she ever jumps onto me, I just kill her, right? Yeah. So at this point, like I kind of one lane already. Now I'm just waiting a bit mm. so I can like slowly build it up with my ult. Mm. Probably gonna use ult again here. And now you see, like I'm already like I'm crashing a huge wave on her. Yeah. Where like I can just kill her anytime I want. And just priming that solo kill. There it is, and that's the important. I actually got the R stacks up, right? That's the. I mean, if you don't and have the having R stacks, the flash. Doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Our, our stacks, massive damage. And having the flash allows me to play like this. Because if I didn't have flash, I, if I lost flash early, like, I would not be able to do any, anything right. like this. Right, because a lot of the small things you're not talking about, you know, either it's bad wave states, bad resets, missing CS, having to blow your flash early, it's going to not bite yeah. you in the ass then. It's usually going to bite you in the ass later on. And this is a classic example. Yeah, because exactly. if you didn't have your flash... It, you know, you probably would maybe still be able to kill, be able to get the kill, but you might trade one for one, or might die to a jungle gank or something yeah, like that. You yeah. have no idea, or it take too long. Also, also another thing on that one is that, like you see, as I I will ult flash and W E because my W can get off before she goes into ah, stealth, then I can kill her with the E. Right, because if e I actually like anyway. eat first, yeah. If I eat first, I would not get my W off. So uh, here it was very crucial to use the combo in this order. Right, and you actually didn't even have time to to Q here as well, right? Because if you actually went for the Q, yeah. she would have stealthed, and then you wouldn't have got your, your yeah. W off. And your W does more damage here, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, makes sense. All right, guys, so we're getting into our usage. Very important part of the guide. Uh, we're going to go through a few clips. Alados is also going to take some time to explain some concepts that are really quite hard to show via clips. So we'll go through some of these clips and then feel free to riff off some stuff here as well, Alados. So this was, you know, the first one talking about max stacks wearing off and really being conscious of, you know, um, how much mana you have to work with, right? So this is probably one of the, the things with Cassidy that's going to take the most time for people to kind of get their head around, right? Yeah, so, so as you can see in this VOD, we, so when I, when I was at the tower, I had like, my ult maximum stack, which means that it's a lot of mana, but it also does a lot of damage. So when we approach fights, we want to have as much mana on our ultimates as possible, while also like being able to afford it. But here, if I use it to keep it keep up the stacks, then I would actually like run out of mana. So I waited for it to wear off, and then I used it once to actually like kind of gap close the fight, and also like stack my ult up a bit. So it does more damage for the fight. It was not really needed in this fight, but it's a very important concept to like get your head around and actually yeah. like start using. Yeah, exactly. And so ultimately this is gonna take a lot of time and feel. So TLDR, we have to balance, okay, we don't you know, later in the game, when you've got you know, uh two or three items, you can probably be a little bit more, I guess, crazy with your R uses because you have more mana to play with. Yeah. There's actually here in this clip, it was 13 minutes in the game. We don't really have much mana to work with. So you need to be extremely careful about going over, you know, over two stacks, really. As soon as you're approaching like your third stack, third, fourth stack, that's where it starts to get like here, you know, it starts to get pretty out of control. But like you said, yeah. that one was pretty flexible. Yeah. Also, like, usually a good way of thinking about it is that your like first was like your 40 mana, 80 mana was are like, mostly used for uh, gap closing they don't do a lot of damage but they are very cheap mm. so usually i like using the first two words as like a gap close as a travel thing later on you can use the 160 mana world or even the 320 mana world for that and by the time you arrive at the fight or at a location where you actually want to fight you would have it on full stack and actually be able to one shot but yeah generally like 40 mana world is like extremely cheap you should use it 
you should not be sitting on your ult costing 40 mana because then you don't have damage if a situation arrives. You have way less flexibility. That's yeah, right. exactly. So this was a great example of, 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 of kind of like thinking about the timing of the stack. So here, the context was that there's a team fight kind of happening around this Baron. It looks like the enemy started Baron because the jungler showed on bot side. And then notice how he's on three stacks here. But he's waiting, Alaros is waiting right to the last second before he pushes that to the fourth stack. Because if he gets the fourth stack too early, he might then have to use this 640 mana R to keep it on four stacks for the fight. So he was able to maximize that time that he's on the three stacks. And now his team has actually, you know, got here. And then he can actually utilize it freely to go for the one shot. So there's a lot happening here, right? There's, there's more than just the alt stacks. There's good quality positioning, patience, poise, you know, target selection, etc. But the main thing we want to get across in this example is the intention behind. You can actively see he was juicing the duration of that R to ensure that he wouldn't have to go over to that four stack too early. Exactly. Also, it keeps a lot of mana if you can, like, delay how many times you reactivate your world to actually keep up the stacks. 100%. So, yeah. Okay, so now we're moving on to proactive R usage. So, you know, in um, in lane, you can kind of use your R reactively or proactively. We'll show an example of reactive in a second, but this is an example of using it proactively, right? Now, because the wave was in such a good position here, right? you know, even if you get charmed, you still have the flexibility of kind of chasing that person down the long lane, right? And sometimes, you know, it's just worth taking that extra bit of damage. Now here, yep. this is also, again, a, quite a multifaceted clip. There's a lot going on in this clip, right? You're not only using the R for damage and, you know, trying to go for a really good trade and threatening the chase down the long lane. You're also using R proactively here to thin the wave as well, which is a very, very yeah, important exactly. concept with Cassidy. Do you want to expand on that? Yeah, so oftentimes both your ult and your E is a very good tool to like farm the waves in a way. So in this case, I could actually like use my ult on the Ari and the wave, which actually allowed me to get a decently good trade on the Ari, get my second ult, the 80 mana ult on the wave, that way farming the wave. And now on my next rotation, I can get Ari low enough for when I can actually crash the wave, then I could actually dive her mm. or do something like that. So now my ult costs 320 mana. So I could either keep the wave state like this, or I could like try to like slow build into a dive or something, but Ari is completely out of the game at this point. Yeah. And this is, again, the power of thinning waves. And again, in this clip specifically, sorry, if you were to R over the wave and not AoE the wave with your R, you would have less trading potential in the future because then even if you were to use your second R on the wave, it wouldn't have killed the wave. And then, then you yeah. might be trading inside a big wave. So when you're pulling the wave on your side or you're allowing the enemy to shove you in, you need to be very very conscious about the size of the wave. So that's why, again, Alados is very good at, at intentionally AWing the wave with that R. Something to keep in mind. And so the next clip here is going to be an example of reactive R usage. Now, you know, you're not always going to be in a scenario where you can use your R proactively, right? Maybe because they have too much threat onto you or maybe the wave isn't in an amazing position. So here in this scenario, we'll go back a little bit. I think I fast forwarded too much. Here in this scenario, you use that that kind of non-committal trading pattern, uh, trading combo. We actually spoke about this in the combo section, right? That was the REQ. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then you stood behind the wave here. So there was no counterplay. And then she used two Qs on the wave then you went for the r then use the minion there to block the e so this was a beautiful example of how you can kind of use your r more creatively and more reactively to take a better quality trade waiting for the enemy to use abilities on the wave and then finding those creative trade windows yeah so it's worth noting that you can really use the caster in passive to like walk through minions at any moment so you can like walk in front and behind the minions without actually like getting minion blocked ever mm. Mm. Yeah, that's actually something that is really underrated because it's, it's like Fizz as well, right? Fizz has the same similar passive, yeah. right? Yeah, really, really underrated. So we're going to be moving on to more advanced ability usage. This is stuff that's not really overly important for some of the beginners, but as you're approaching maybe what Diamond 4 Plus or something like that, you might, you know, these are things that need to be kind of embedded within your play to get reliable results in solo queue. Um, so let's get into the details of this. First one is standard proactive queue usage. So, you know, you know, waves in a pretty good position. 
we're completely fine. We can be quite, I guess, proactive with our Q usage. You know, you don't you don't even need it to block any damage. Maybe they've already used their ability on the wave. You already know maybe the wave's already coming into you or whatever it might be. There's going to be moments where it's going to get free damage with our Q, right? Pretty straightforward. Yep. And then we have reactive Q usage. And this is a huge, like you were reiterating early on the guide, a huge part of playing Cassid and reactive to abilities. And, you know, a lot of people think, you know, oh, so what? Who gives a shit about one Lissandra Q? It's not about that one Lissandra Q, right? It's about every single Lissandra Q. If you do that for every Lissandra Q, that damage is going to add up, add up, add up. You know, you might mitigate three, four, 500 damage over the course of, you know, one or two, two minutes or something, three minutes. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And then we have relocating wave location with Q. Yeah, so this is an interesting one because since Cassidy and Q will actually draw a crew, you can actually like kind of relocate where the two waves will meet in a lot of the cases. So like here, I'm actually pulling the wave closer, so I will have an easier time CSing every minion with auto attacks. As well as like making Kiana's life a bit harder when she actually tries to go for the last hit. Yeah, so this is intentional. You know that I mean this does this does two things, right? It obviously procs the first track, which is nice. But again, yeah. allows you to freely farm here, which is really nice. Yeah. Also, like a uh, Kiana specific thing is Kiana usually doesn't really have a lot of sustain, so just using Qs and Es on her is mm -hmm. very like makes the lane a lot more custom in favor every single time because she can never come back from like getting poked down. This one is another example, very similar example, right? Relocating the uh, low minion to farm with Q. So here in this scenario, you hit the Casio, same thing. And as a result, that melee walks forward towards you and which we can just clean it up. These yeah. are very small things that will just help you get more farm, better quality wave states, you know, all the things that are very important for Cassidy. Yeah, also with that Casio clip, it's, you could just kill the minion, right? Like you could always just kill the minion to farm it. But if you kill the minion, you don't get like a good trade onto the Casio. So this is also a way to like get more trades in, even while taking the same amount of CS, which is very good. Then we have last hitting and trading at the same time with E. Right, pretty stock standard. And then we have uh, how to clear the wave properly with R. So walk us through this one here, Alados. Yeah, so... At the beginning, since here I have 40 mana ult, I will use my ult before the waves meet. I don't want to wait for like a long time. So I will just use it on the melees. I will also thin them like kind of evenly. And then I will use my E and my ult to hit the entire wave. Again, even if my E doesn't kill the melees there, my ult can hit the entire wave. So that's something very important to look at. You should hit all six or seven of the minions with both your E and your ult, because you can do that. So that ult would have hit every minion as well. Beautiful. And then you just finish with the cannon and it's a very, very fast wave clear. Very well, efficient. So now me and Alad are gonna try and attempt to break down what poise looks like from a Cassidy's perspective. Now this is a very tricky concept for us to explain. But Alados has kind of said, you know, a few times that this is an incredibly important part of playing Cassidy. And for all the Cassidy players watching this, you all know that the mindset we need to have as a Cassidy is, okay, no matter what happens, I always have the ability to win the game in the mid to late game when I get to my key spikes. So I cannot compensate. I cannot do dumb shit, follow roams, panic, FF for 15. You must stay poised. You must stay patient and you must be willing to make those sacrifices with the, I guess, the confidence, right, that you're going to be able to make up the difference later on when you do eventually get to your spikes. So this is a game you played um, against a, a Talon. And we're just going to skim through bits and pieces here. We're just going to kind of walk through Alados's mindset throughout this this VOD. And essentially, you know, we are going to have these games as a Cassidy, right? These are going to be quite common, especially the high elo you get, where the enemy's just going to be running around the map, killing your bot lane, you know, Shit's going to hit the fan, essentially. Now, you have two options, right? You can panic. And be like, oh my god, this is FF for 15. Bot lane's bad. They didn't listen to my pings, blah, 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 blah. Or we can actually be like, you know what? All right, the game's going to game's gonna be a little bit tricky, but I can stay focused. I can stay poised and wait for the enemy to make mistakes and get to my key spikes. 
And out of interest for you, Alados, how long was it? How long did it take you personally to kind of develop this poise and confidence in your gameplay? I think, I mean, I wasn't aware of like it being a thing at the beginning, right. but I think over like a span of like a year or two of playing Castle, I actually like naturally kind of developed it. But I think it takes a long time. It takes a very long time because you have to be very confident with your champion. You have to need, you need, you need the mastery. And then you also need to be okay with like stuff happening. Yeah, 100%. But I think like for Castle in laning phase specifically, a good mindset to have for poise is that you your enemy will often roam and you will not be able to follow pre six. And that's that's just how it is, right? There is always a value you can get on your lane. There is always something you can do to like put yourself into a better position at the cost of your enemy, like not being in lane, right? So if they go for a ward, if they go for like a bot room, they go for a whatever, you always can get something out of it. If it's just maintaining a freeze and denying a wave of XP, that's already good enough, right? In this example, for example, I am just I kind of just have to freeze it. I don't I I'm not level six yet, so I cannot get the wave in. So right now I'm just denying some experience. Yeah, and if we fast forward here, it looks like Talonman's up roaming bot side. But there's obviously not much for us to do in terms of following that roam, so we decided to just shove this and get a, a good reset for ourselves. So for us, yeah. from a cast of the perspective, we're happy. Yep, our bot lane die a little yeah, bit absolutely. there. Absolutely. It is what it is. Yeah, the infamous bot lane sacrifice play. Yeah, and now as you can see, Talon comes back, immediately roams. We don't know where he was roaming. He ends up roaming topside this time, killing the Teemo. So we could already yep. start to see. But this time on this roam, we were able to net ourselves a plate because the Talon actually stayed on topside. So now we can, and again, notice yeah. how you're not compensating. You're not doing, trying to do counter rooms on the other side of the map. We don't try, we're not overcomplicating it. Yeah. Valuing our resources here. Yeah. I mean, my wave is my first, right? Like I need to get my wave always. Because if I don't get my wave, like that's the main way of losing games on Castle. Mm -hmm. Just sacrificing waves, right? So here I could get like two waves, two plates. I probably got more out of this room than Talon did. So this is very good for me. I can get a good reset. I can get to my lost chapter. I can get back to lane. Talon might also do it again. Like he might as well just like push and roam or do whatever. Right? He could also like try to punish me. But at this point, I'm so ahead in XP and I'm like so strong that he probably would have a disadvantage. So this is very important here, right? Look at the chat here. Bot dies to another, I think they die to another gank or something. Ezreal in, in chat saying FF. And then the bot lane, I think says, I mean, so the the jungler says open, right? Yeah, and then and I just go mute both of them. Just mute, mute, move on. <laughs> Literally mutes them and then focuses on what he needs to do. As long as he's farming well and he's doing what he needs, he's playing in accordance to Cassidy's identity, the game is always winnable. This is going to yeah. be one of the hardest things for people to internalize because this is the thing, Alados, right? People watching this guide, right? You know, they're not going to have the the the, the mid-game, I guess, prowess yet to yeah. actually execute and carry in the mid-game, right? They're not going to have that threat assessment. They're not going to know their damage output where they are. They're not going to have that good loading positioning. So, But this is part yeah. of the journey. You have to put yourself in this position so many times to be able to actually be a good quality cast and player and have success with Cassidy. Because yeah. you can't be scared to have the resources as Cassidy. That is the solo queue contract that you sign. By playing Cassidy, you are the carry. Right? Yeah. You are the carry. You cannot be afraid. All exactly. the resources are going to be on you. And that's going to take time to be a carry. You've got to have that confidence. You've got to have that ability to team fight effectively. And that only comes through repetitions. So this game state. They might follow, they might be watching this and be like, oh, th this is me. The key difference here is that you actually have the ability to then execute those team fights, which is a skill. You know, we're obviously going to go through a, a, a lot of team fights in, in this guide and, and team fighting principles and stuff. But reminder, guys, just because the enemy's roaming and everyone's raging and shit, that, that's normal. <laughs> welcome, welcome to playing Cassidy. Yeah. 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 But also, you will see this. Like another thing. Oh, sorry, you go on. Yeah. yeah so in this position, like, if you go back like a uh, half a minute, like you can see my reset, I would have a good like roam opportunity, right? 
Like this could have been something where I can like look to a dive, look to do something. But this is where poise comes into play. You don't have to make risky plays. And that's the luxury of playing Castorin. You actually don't have to make risky plays. Like the risky play for the enemy is letting you not take risky plays, you know? So unless they force you into a risky play, like you don't have to ever take it. Mm. And that's so incredibly powerful because as long as you don't take a risky play, Castorin always reaches a spike where he can carry, right? There will be some games in very high elo where he doesn't, but usually even there, like, you have so many opportunities to, like, make a play that it's completely fine. And, so and here, look like... Look at this. Look at this. Even despite everything, because you've kept your XP up, because you've actually farmed relatively well, you actually can start winning trades in a lot of these melee matchups because once you get, like, four points in your A, you do a lot of damage. Yeah, exactly. So now you see, like, this is the Talon that actually got, like, four kills from roaming. He's, like, 4-0 or something. I'm 0, 0, 0. I have not done anything. And the matchup is, like, looking a lot more different now. But there's a lot of reactive ability usage here. So you'll see in a second, you sack up your yeah. R on the wave here. Talon then uses W on the wave. So we got that beautiful yeah. reactive combo there with the auto W on the back end as well. And then we have eight stacks of Conqueror. So we're going for one more time. And that's actually the third yeah. R, which does a lot of damage. And then we get instant 12 stacks. So now, because you're sitting on 12 stacks, that Talon can't do anything. has to give prior over the wave as well. So just like yeah. that, with good quality of reactive R usage, we're able to now get control over the lane. Yeah. So no, then Talon, Talon ditches been... again. Look at that. <laughs> yeah. So he he's like panicking now, right? Like he just sees a kill. He He's kind of panicking at this point. Yeah, 100%. I can just... Take another plate, another plate or two, another okay, wave, right. and now suddenly, like the game seems absolutely free win. Honestly, I'm zero zero zero, but I know already I have won this game. Even though my sidelines are losing to Talon and my, like, uh, yeah, they are basically losing to Talon. They are losing to Varus. They are losing to Rengar. Yeah, look at so, this two and zero Rengar, three and one Talon, five and two Varus. You would look at this and think, oh, losing bot, losing top, losing jungle, can't win. But now you're an incredibly strong casted and heading into the mid game. Yeah, unlosable. Like I could play this game a hundred times and win it ninety nine. So it's it's a very very good position, and it's a very good position because I have not compensated. I have not like done anything bad, and now. You see, now the Talon goes for an extra room, and now I'm very strong. This is the moment when I have my boots. I have my ability to actually start leaving the lane. And even here, you see, like, I went in for the room. It didn't really work out. Varus would, uh came out on me. And now it's... I'm just not going to take the risky play anymore. And still, gonna... we're, not, we're not feeling stressed, right? We're going to hop... Because this is where you're actually yeah. at a spike. You're at your crown, right? You're actually somewhat yeah. decently strong. We're not god mode yet. But we're still pretty pretty strong, right? So that doesn't yeah. mean we can, you know, we can throw our lead and try and do all this crazy shit. Still, we've got to keep up a farm and value our life. But we're more open to the idea of potentially following one of these rooms and getting in on the action, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. So yeah, at this point, I I will just go back to lane. It's a very good spot for us. We can start playing the game with confidence now. We can start actually like making plays happen if we want to. But then again, you have the luxury on Castorin that for you not making a play is a winning play so many times because you're scaling so well. Like, you're the strongest scaling champion league. You cannot lose. If, you, if the game goes on for one more minute, it's almost always more favorable for you. Very rare that it isn't. Hmm. So, yeah. All right, so we're in the mid game now. You know, we, we've got a crown like, a, like we've mentioned. You know, we've, we're trying to adopt this mindset where if opportunities present themselves, we'll take it, right? But we're not going to force anything. So essentially what's happened this game is that Talon has just roamed himself to death. Um, so again, your mindset, I'm assuming, is still keeping up that farm. Yes, exactly. So I want to get my waves. And once there's no waves, I might look to do something. But if the Talon roams... I will still just like go for my waves and like get my tower, whatever, mm. whatever I need to get. I'm not going to compensate for these plays because again, even if he gets two kills here, right? Even then I'm like in such a good scanning position that I just don't really mind as much. 
So now I got the tower, I got the wave, I got a possible roam opportunity on the Rengar or like whoever I want to. So here we have one stack of our ultimate already. It looks yeah. like we go for a second stack as well. Yeah, with, with this like amount of CDR, you can definitely get a lot of stacks, right? Yeah. I could definitely chase down the Rengar no matter what he did as well. And, so. and this sort of play is only possible because you're strong enough. Again, you're 130 farm. Yeah. You know, we're pretty strong. Yeah. We're in a position to make a play like this. If we had compensated or if we had roamed and got behind the next play, this is not really the sort of play that we'd be even yeah. able to make. Yeah. And these are the, this is what we mean by opportunities will present themselves when you are strong as a Cassidy. Because of your terrain scaling and how yeah. you know unbelievable how good the champion is when you're ahead, these are the sorts of things that will happen. So... Yeah. We're getting very strong. Again, Talon's roaming, getting a lot of kills. AD carries dying on repeat, essentially, here. Talon gets another double kill. Do you know what's funny about this? I could have just taken the the compensation room, like, seeing the, how low the Talon is and, like, try to get something. Or something, yeah. But, but I just literally finish my recall. Like, I start my recall here. <laughs> and then, like, I'm just gonna watch them die. Get my tempo play, get my good reset get whatever I want to get, right? And just be very strong on the map when I need to be very strong on the map. I'm just gonna play for resource, resource, resource. Yep. Get everything. And also like the Rengar kill happened as well because I was two levels up. Because I got every XP on the map. Like I never lost XP. Other than the one wave where like I roamed bot and there was nothing happening, right? Yep. And then again, same thing here. Plays are happening topside, but you've got your Archangel sitting in base, your Seraph sitting in base. So again, yeah. we're, we're going back, making sure we buy our item, then we can maybe make a play. Yeah. But I think I might TP there, but I might not. Wow. Actually, I might not TP because we don't have information on the Talon, and I still feel like this TP might be a missed opportunity, mm. like, uh, retrospectively. Mm. Like, I probably could have gone there. But if I die, it's, like, very bad, and then I didn't have information on the Talon, on the Varus, like... On many people, right? So, and if I die, like in games like this, I'm very strong and I can do a lot of stuff. But if I die, game might be extremely, incredibly hard to win because mm. everyone on the enemy team is quite ahead. Yep. And now we're heading into the side lane. We're on our two items. It's Ten CS per minute. I mean, this yeah. guy can't literally do anything to us. Beautiful, got a very creative, you know, R to the side. I really, really love that. So he waited for you to use abilities on the wave, but then you were able to kind of. R to the side to kind of stand outside that W. And even if it hit, it wouldn't even matter. I mean, you've got crown. Yeah. Talon can't do anything to you. And we just explode him. And yeah. there's that 400 gold shut down. Just like that. Yeah. And now if the game wasn't, you know, already in your mind over, it is extremely over here. I mean, like it's out of control. unlosable level. Like, <laughs> absolutely unlosable. <laughs> even though the team is behind. Like, I'm only ahead, right? Yeah. But me being ahead is, like, good enough for me to win the game. Yeah. And then this Talon's probably panicking, right? Imagine from the Talon's perspective. He's probably thinking, oh my god, yeah, this Cassidy's absolutely. getting really strong. I need to do something. <laughs> but then, you yeah, know, exactly. He's, he's, he's losing himself the game. Yeah. So it actually even looks make like a we mistake die here. here. Yeah, it looks like we make a mistake here. So it'll be interesting to see how yeah. we bounce back from this one. So it looks like Kane made a really nice creative pick there, bush camping. Was able to catch yeah. us off guard. Yeah. So big shutdown. So we end up going back yeah. to base, reversing a lot of AD this game. So we decide to build our Frozen yeah. Heart and we're going the Conqueror build this one. So we've got the Frozen Heart as our third item. Yeah. Getting into the side lane yet again, shoving out. And this is where, you know, we're going to be covering more of this kind of, you know, macro stuff a little bit later on in the guide. But fundamentally, you know, just playing out the shoving out the sides, looking to shove and move and collapse, essentially, using your terrain scaling to get creative. So you say like the way I use the ult into that bush is like a way that you can do to actually avoid the vision or like if they are doing the crux. Right? Ah, I see what you mean. So, because you so went from if, there to there. If that bush yeah. was not warded right now, the, the Rengar is that. He wouldn't, because Rengar that. wouldn't see you getting into that bush. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, your world doesn't like show if you're out of vision. So, mm. so they, they don't know that I'm there. That you can also use on bot lane. Like you can like walk out Ult into the first bush, then into the second bush, into the third bush, and you can make creative uh, picks like yeah, that too. Yeah, through the lane. Got you. Yeah, and it yeah. looks like we get we guy die again. So some port, you know, some some questionable yeah. threat assessment here. It looks like they, they catch you off guard. Yeah. There's a combination yeah. of the multiple flashes here. Rengar did a very very 
nice ultimate there was able to get across the wall because you were rooted and they played that quite well. Yeah. Yeah. I got my frozen heart regardless. Uh, I So these plays were like kind of lack of poise plays. Mm. I think like I do not need to make those plays, right? Mm. This was an odd game though. Ever since then I had this as like a learning objective and I've already, I think, fixed these kind of issues mm. in the mid to late game, but yeah. this is definitely something that has lost me games. Like, me dying like that can lose me games. It can right? 100% like lose me games, yeah. Yeah. And, like, we're not going to go too deep on the macro because we'll cover this later on, but, like, again, yeah. we just want to get across the mindset. And because, you know, he was, you know, making those sacrifices in the early lane in terms of the enemy roaming and not compensating, just playing for himself, he's in this position where, despite... Talon having seven kills, he has incredible kill threat on to, to many people and he can kind of get work done in the mid to late game. So we'll kind of skim forward a little bit. You know, Actually, can you go back to that Varus sword? I think that's an important thing that's like part of the equation here. Okay. Because like you see, like I could have tried to go for this skill, but for me, like right now, because I'm poised, for me just to get the Varus sword before like a dragon fight is incredibly valuable in my mind so completely fine with just like doing this mm. and that's also something that like many people do wrong like they feel like okay i like i engaged i i try to do something and unless i get a kill it's like not valuable like it's quite the opposite you can actually like do a lot of stuff like just getting the varus what is such a game winning thing for custody right yeah really good point yeah, remember, you're, if you're baiting out key abilities, um, you're essentially, you know, creating a future, potentially yeah. a, an opportunity in the future, or you're creating windows for other people. Yeah. Yep. And so, looks like some shenanigans happen here. Again, where we're now approaching our fourth item. We're approaching level 16, God Mode. Find ourselves a nice Maybe little pick. A nice, nice pick. Take a look at how we play this one. Yeah, so right now I'm extremely stacks. incredibly strong. Oh, very very. So close. that's a bit. Yeah, I mean, I this play is absolutely disturbing. You should never make this play. Why so not? What about this makes this one disturbing? I'm level fifteen with seventy percent XP. I should never look to make a play right now. I should get my wave, get my XP, get level 16, get my elixir. And then I can like literally kill all of these people. No problem. If I have my words up. Mm. But since I didn't, I actually die before I get like my spike. I actually try to make a play and that might cost us Baron at this point. We made Although the game we get... necessarily. But I wouldn't, for, for me, it's interesting because it's very difficult for me to look at this because I don't know what your men mentality was. This could be a lack of poise problem. It could just be your um, yeah, your current yeah. understanding, your current level of play, and you know yeah, you yeah, thought yeah. you could get the get in, get out, right? So there's two lenses yeah, yeah. to look at this one through. This is why this one is a bit common. Only you would know, yeah. right? Only you. I mean, this is more like a limit test play, uh, if I remember correctly. Like right. I just wanted to like try because I was very strong in this game. I kind of wanted to like test my limits, like what I can get away with. Even though, like, for winning the game, this is a wrong play. If right. I'm if I'm honest, like, I should get my level 16, and then I should get my elixir. Because once I have those two, like, I, I will do so much damage. Like, look at this tunnel. He, he can't play the game. Hmm. And then, yeah, I think I get the blue buff. Blue buff, very important late game. Yeah, I mean, these kind of fights are just, like, what you look for, for ca like, as a casting. You can very easily like kill almost everyone. Have infinite mana. Not really have to worry <laughs> about like much stuff. Yeah, and I think we've demonstrated the point here. Because now you're yeah. now, now yeah. you're in a you're in a scenario where you know this is where Cassidy thrives. You've now brought the game to a point where you've gotten to your like you know four items post level sixteen, and this is where a lot of the time winning a game as Cassidy, you know, isn't overly difficult. So hopefully, yeah. this, you know. You guys watching this can kind of get what we're trying to get across here. This, 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 this. Uh, I guess mindset of poise, being patient, 
believing in your ability to execute in the mid to late game. And this is something that you're all gonna have to work on throughout your Cassidy journey. So now we're gonna be talking about the value of HP. You know, what we're talking about here today is I think, I guess, compounded or overemphasized with Cassidy. Like you were saying before, you know, off camera, this is probably something that applies to every champion in the game. Um, so walk yep. us through, how do you view this concept and, and walk us through this clip here? Yes. Usually when you're casted in, right, you're going to get shoved in. There's, there's two main like key things here. The first one is when you get shoved in, your ability to see as under tower is greatly influenced by the amount of head that you have. If you actually lose like a lot of HP, you might get in trouble. And right here, I'm like kind of fine. Just like CSing, but at the same time, the next wave, if she keeps pushing, I will just get dived eventually. Like, I literally have a big like target on my back if I'm staying on low HP and if I don't have HP. That's why, like, a lot of the times, getting D shield just to have more health in general creates, like, reduces the amount of chaos in the lane, and that's very good. So in this clip, I just basically like took a bad trade that cost me my TP. Because if I don't TP, there's a target on my back. I might get dived. I might get like denied like waves. I might get like very bad things. And this this clip is a very good way of like like this showcases how you actually deal with like losing a lot of health and not having the health. Which in the next clip we will see that. If you if you don't do the play, and this is the same matchup in a different scenario where I'm like, okay, I'm kind of low HP. But here in this game, I think I lack the poise to like just take the reset. And I, I lose my health here. And, and that's what that's now a trade that you would deem unnecessary. There's no point going for that. We should be valuing our our HP here. I think it's not even just the value of HP. It's just like not valuing my reset when I have to take the reset because of my low HP, right? Because if I like here, I don't reset. I don't value like me, like going back to base to reset my HP. And what happens next is that okay, now I'm in the same position kind of, hmm. but suddenly like the entire Avengers arrives and I will get denied a wave. I will never have a reset opportunity again. And it's just gonna be very dope. Now you're in a really bad it's, spot, and and, and yeah. you know you could have just reset on this counter way, right? You had like I should, I, like here it's the easiest reset of my life, right? Mm -hmm. If I just take it, but I was not taking it, and so by so what you're pressing. saying here is that by not valuing your HP or by um by staying in lane with low HP, you've actually yeah. made it harder to keep up your farm which is actually going to dig you a deeper and deeper hole. So sometimes it is yeah, better just exactly. to, to accept reality. Okay, I've taken a bit too much damage here. Maybe that's just the matchup. Maybe that's just the way the lane yeah, panned out. Yeah. I've got to get, come back, stay healthy, so I can actually farm without getting denied yeah. CS. Right. Yeah. That's... And this is like a, like this is a play I see a lot among like Astarine players where they just stay in lane in like kind of the quicksand situation, right? With like a very bad lane tendency, like losing a lot of waves, losing like three minions every wave. And they just like dig a deeper and deeper hole and they just cannot come back after like Agreed. like staying in this lane state. If I stay in this lane state for like two minutes, the game is over, I lost. But like there's also something that we don't have in the clips, but whenever you're like max health, you can do anything you want. Like you can go for roams, you can join skirmishes, you can fight, you can take a wave, you, you can take a plate, you can like outplay you can stay like you can do whatever you want but once you're low hp and that's true for other champs as well when you're low hp you cannot roam especially you cannot really... as melees melees yes. especially yes, right because exactly. you don't have that i mean you need to be able to trade aggressively have offense as defense yeah especially as we're reversing a ranged right if you're a fizz that's low in resources in lane you're literally a useless champion you're not a champion. You're not a champion. You're a minion. You're yeah. you're worse than a minion. You, there's nothing you can do, right? At least sometimes you yeah. feel low as a as a uh, as a range. Sometimes you can get away with it because you're yeah, probably not going to be roaming anyway. You could kind of keep your distance, but as a melee, it's 
<clears throat> incredibly important. So now we're moving into lol set usage. Again, a concept that is probably not only, I mean, definitely not only uh, towards Kassadin, right? This is for every champion, but we're going to be talking about it through the lens of Kassadin. So when we see, you know, we're coming off a lol set here, we're coming out of base, when we see this kind of game state, what's really coming to your mind? What sort of information are you processing? What are you looking for? Okay, so first, obviously, I'm looking for two things. Uh, threats, which is either threats that defend against me, like magic resist, mainly. Like I'm looking at magic resist, Sonya, Exos, that kind of stuff. And the second is things that can kill me. Like in this game, I'm looking at mainly the Kane, right? Or the Varusword. Like Kane, Varusword, Lux-Q. This is also the game that we watched for the uh, boys guide. Yeah. So this is a little state where I'm like, okay, my team is kind of losing. I'm the main win condition. So I'm I'm going to think about three things. I'm going to think about my threats first, the win conditions, and what's my role. And in this game, I can be a massive win condition. They don't have magic resist. They are kind of full AD. So I can definitely be a very, very, very strong champ here. I'm also very healthy. I'm I have a lot of XP, a lot of gold. I have my item spikes. I'm, I have a lot of gold, like everything. I will hit my spikes very soon. Enemy is full AD, so I can definitely scale into this game incredibly well. So my win condition will be scaling. And my role, basically, will be to kill these people, basically. It's... Because you're not really playing for anyone else. Yeah. There is no real reliable secondary yeah. win condition in a game like this. Because sometimes... You know, with this setup specifically, you know, you have mentioned sometimes you can create space for other people to do damage. This is not really yeah. one of those games where you're creating space for anyone else to do damage. You are the main damage dealer. So this is a good framework that you guys can follow that Alados just walked through. Number one, identifying the key threats, not only offensively, but to kind of def defensively. So key CC abilities and high damage threats. So in this game, like you mentioned, that of the Varus R, the Lux Q... Kane knockup, etc. Things that really bother you, but then also the defensives, right? The exhaust, the magic resist, etc. There's also the role assessment and there's the win conditions. Now with this game, as you can see, they all kind of go hand in hand. It's all pretty similar. You, you know, in this game, Cassidy is the carry. We're not really creating space for anyone anyone else. Um, and the win condition is us, right? So there are gonna be other games where we might be a secondary carry to an incredibly fed Kane. Or we might be a secondary carry to an, uh, uh, into a maybe a very fed Phalios Lulu bot lane. So it's not only you, maybe there's a fed bot lane that we can play around and create a little bit of space for as well. So, you know, there's something yeah. to kind of keep in mind in your games. Yeah, also something is that like threat assessment is not only for you. Like threat assessment is threat assessment for your win conditions. Like if you have a fed ADC and your job is peeling him, then you will not be like, okay, who has magic resist? You will be like, okay, who can kill my win condition, right? And that's what will dictate what your role is in the game. And sometimes, yeah, it will be just to like carry like 1v9, whatever. But sometimes it, it will be like, okay, I need to peel. I have to try to kill the person that's trying to kill my win condition and stuff like that. Beautiful. All right, so we've got lol state number two here. What's running through your mind in a lol state like this, this sort of game state? Yeah, so I just died. I got my item, so I'm I'm pretty strong. I have first strike setup, so I'm probably looking to like make a play in the mid game. I don't see any magic resist, but I know like Sion can be like a side lane threat. I also see that my team is kind of in a good position. So right now, even though I'm kind of behind, like from this dev, I'm in a very, very insanely good position to win this game. So I can just come back and play it very, very calculated. I don't have to take any risks because my team is doing good. And we automatically scale if my team is going doing like very good. The Belvet might be a big threat because Belvet has the ability to like block damage and Kassarin kind of does his entire damage in like less than a second, right? Mm. So if Belvet times the E very well, then I will just be in danger. Mm. So yeah, right now what I want to do is I seem to be winning the 1v1 extremely hard, so I should look to isolate my lane as much as possible, gain value from like playing my waves, getting trades, and then opportunistically I will play around my jungler that's also like quite ahead and uh, maybe look to make a play on the Belvet at some point. Beautiful. So this is yeah, this is a game where you know you're not only thinking about 
what's bothering you now, but it's also what could bother yeah. you in the future, right? And you're, so yeah. this is again tying into your 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 role assessment. And in a game like this, where you know that they've only you know they've got one dragon, you know. Um, they don't really have someone that's really out of control fed and the game's relatively slow paced. We're chilling. We're absolutely chilling. We don't need to panic. Yeah. Okay, so we're entering into the third lull state here. Okay, this one's a very bit of a different one. It looks like we have a very behind bot lane. So really what, what comes to mind here? So in this one, we definitely see, okay, I have a fat top laner, but the enemy has an extremely fat ADC. So right now my thought process is, okay, I need to somehow deal with desire. The other ones are just like, there are many annoyances. Like this game is very hard to play if they play it very well, because Rakan can peel extremely well. Kiana can play to peel as well. Lilia can like sleep me. So this game might get extremely hard, especially since Gragas can also like just sit on top of the ADC and E me. So what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to get a flank get a pick, get uh like get something happening though not yet i can definitely play very poised right now because the game is not like they cannot explode the game yet there's no like major objectives they have like one mountain drake so the drakes like they haven't stacked like three drakes yet i definitely have time to scale in this game and once i hit my crown set of uh, frozen heart in this one i will definitely be able to deal with the zaya and the the kiana will not be able to kill me I will then probably buy Abyssal Mask because they have very, like a lot of hybrid threat as well. And then I think then we're chilling. We just use the Aniston or like Shantaunt or something to get an opening. And in the late game, I can definitely run down the entire team okay. once I have like four items. Interesting. Okay. Um, Moving on. I think, was that the last one? Do we have any more? There's one more here. Lol state number four. Okay, so this one's uh, very tricky. So what's running through your 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 head here? So I see a Fed Vein of Fed Viego and a pretty strong set, and they have a Cassio Gregor. So, and my team, everyone is extremely behind, right? Like I have a one six Echo Jungle. He's he's on one item. Uh, I have a Camille Top, who was like pushed in all the way. He's very weak. Like this game seems incredibly hard to win even though like i'm winning lane even though i'm strong in this game they have so many champs like set has a point click stun that can like chain cc me for like a long time viego can pretty much start check me as much as i like as long as i don't one shot him and cassio w will always be annoying and vayne is like vayne has shield bow. this this was when shield bow was still mythic right so in this game and gragas has mercs and magic resist this game seems pretty unwinnable, honestly. I have to like I have to find some creative pick. This is when poise kind of goes out of the window because you can't just wait to win the game because you get outscared. In this game, Castering gets outscared unless like everyone else was like decently strong, right? So this game is gonna be incredibly hard to win if I can yeah. even this win. Is, it. This is as hard as it gets, right? Because of their peel, yeah. because of their mobility, because of the lack of multi-threat on your your composition's behalf. Yeah. You just simply don't have enough power to actually kill that vein. Maybe if you had yeah. a fed Camille, you would have a chance, right? Because you could maybe play with the Camille and then dive yeah. onto the vein yeah. or something. There needs to be some semblance of multi-threat, but because Echo's really far behind yeah. and how good those champions are into you. And again, we're seeing a trend here when they have high CC, high peel, and make your life a hell of a lot harder, right? When you see champs like Gragas, yeah. Rakan, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. Desire exactly. and stuff like that, Vayne, it does make your life a hell of a lot harder, um, which yeah. is something you guys have to consider in game. But so, you know, ultimately what we're talking about here is not just Cassidy and stuff. This is really understanding the game holistically and really understanding how Cassidy thrives or what makes Cassidy thrive in a game. And as we're starting to see, right, Cassidy seems to like versing low threat, I mean, low CC, Right, low peel. You know, uh, he very enjoy, very much enjoys having multi threat on his team. Someone else that can create a little bit of space for him, vice versa. Right, whether you have some yeah. similar to a secondary carry, um, but then also a slower ga uh, pace game. Right, if someone's not stacking dragons or the game's very slow pace, we're also happy with that as well. We're getting into skirmishing now, and on Castellan, I 
really like to approach skirmishes from a different perspective. Most people like approach them from like a micro macro perspective. Like you want to look at your micro, you want to look at whether it's a good play. On Kassadin, I would do it the opposite way. You would look at whether you have to go for a skirmish or not first. And like, what's the cost of the skirmish? In this scenario, I can move because I shoved my wave. So there's essentially no cost to the skirmish because I can just get back to my lane and like be fine with it, right? Right, so like even if nothing would have happened here, it doesn't even matter, right? Because you've got your wave yeah, out, you're happy, yeah, you're chilling. Exactly. As long as you don't die, yeah. we're all good. Yeah, also I can't really get any value in lane after I shove the wave into the Syndra, so now it's like kind of whatever. I can just get back to my lane and we're fine with it, right? So even though like the skirmish, like nothing happened, it has no cost to me, essentially, other than me inting away half my health bar here. And this is the second one. This was actually like one game that I had you review in the MLA. Where I go for a roam and uh, there's kind of a dive situation. But I kind of go for like a Leblanc clone. <laughs> it ends up being a bit scuffed. And now I can't really go back to lane because I lost the value of health, right? And now look at my mid wave. Mm. It's tragic, right? Yeah, now this it's is just really not good. Because no not only do you is... not get like even if you got the kill, you were already gonna lose farm, right? That's the that's the thing here as yeah, well. Yeah, exactly. It's it's the reverse talon, you know, where you you own you don't get a kill, but even if you got a kill, like you would lose way too much value from the mid wave, the XP that you would have gotten that now I'm falling behind the curve of the game. And I think I ended up losing this game because of this play. Yeah, and this is not this is just not simply not Kassanen's identity. Right, unless that exactly. champion had maybe a fat bounty, you know, it's probably not worth yeah, this yeah. way, right? Because even if you got yeah. that kill, you're going to lose a bunch of HP either way. You know, you're going to miss that entire wave mid. Um, this is an absolute disaster. Yeah, and so much tempo is lost, and tempo is such an important resource on Castellan. It's so insane. Oh man, this just gives you like a visceral feeling. Like this is <laughs> it doesn't look like you play this is Like, yeah, this is a very <laughs> Oh, Highly no. disturbing, yeah. This is just disaster. You already know the game's just so screwed after that. Yeah, it's 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 disaster. It's like so. Yeah, and this so is the walk bad. of shame. The walk of shame back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you should really, really not roam when you would lose like so much from. It. All right, so now we're getting Especially... into the vision plays, right? So this is where Cassidy really thrives. This is where you can start to get quite creative. Yeah, so obviously your terrain scaling will allow you to like make picks like this, where you can like use your abilities to one shot someone. Yeah, and this should be something you should actively think about, right? Whether or not they have vision, and this yeah, is fundamentally exactly. why sweeper is so important. It's kind of because of your terrain scaling, you can make this sort yeah. of happen play, this 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 play happen quite reliably. Yeah, yeah, we will have like a fog of war, um, like slide as well, with, like a lot of examples. So All right. it's also something. We will elaborate later on. So now we're going to get into some skirmishing examples. These are, are you know, some differing examples of skirmishes to see how Alados yeah. approaches them. Approaches them. So let's just so go here... back a little bit. Let's just set the scene. So it looks like the enemy's on the rift here. Kendra's jumped over the wall. We're priming our R here. So we've kind of gone for the one sack. We've also done the sweeper here as well, just to make sure that this is not watered. We see that the diner actually is not moving. Still like collecting yeah, so very out. important before we even begin, right? I shoved the wave before I moved, first off. I don't have a big gold in my pocket. I don't have like... I, like the skirmish does not have any red flags. I don't have a lot of gold. I'm not sitting before like an item spike. I'm not like doing any of that crazy stuff, right? And you just hit level 11. Yeah, exactly. So I'm fighting around my spikes, around prio around like shoving my wave and not losing anything so this is a no cost skirmish for me that's very important hmm. now obviously like what i what Cassidy loves to do is play with like a secondary carry in skirmishes and like try to use their threat as a method for like making people burn stuff on them. Like you see the Wukong goes on my Kindred. I could go on the Gangplank, but I will just want to play together with my carry. And that will allow me to actually get a, a clean pick on the Wukong 
save my carry and be in a completely fine, very healthy position even after the skirmish. And even get your Which presence of mind good. back as well. Your presence yeah, of mind exactly. is very important. I don't think I had presence of mind this game though. Right. I have first strike. With first ah, strike, you don't okay. really get precision, gotcha. right? Right. Interesting. Okay. I also went ever frost that game, but yeah. So this is another example. This one we've actually got the Ludens build. Yeah. With a lesser, so, very burst centric. Yeah. So you see, like being next to the wall is incredibly important because when you're next to a wall, you can use your terrain scanning to like mitigate a lot of threats, a mm -hmm. lot of abilities. Like when you're next to a wall, you're technically unkillable by many, many, many things, right? Then here we have like a bit of very patience. Uh, like patience is incredibly important here this because if so I use my ult in, yeah. Like if I ever ult in here, like I'm just dead. But I can definitely use my EQ to poke, and that's very important here, right? And I'm I'm just not gonna commit to the skirmish like the middle of it. I'm just gonna look to find opportunities, find picks. Now I slow with my E, get some some of my utility in, and then finish off the skirmish with. Playing a bit back, I, I still don't want to like really risk anything. Like my life is still first. It's very, very patient, they ever, like... very poised, very, very controlled. Yeah. I mean, this is and just... by the time they actually go in, like I can go on them and actually like kill everyone. This is just so patient. I mean, if we go all the way back here, I mean, this is just, I mean, there's so many moments where I can see someone dying. Like, I mean, this is the first one, right? Sitting around the edges being annoying in this build specifically right you don't have enough damage at this stage to actually one shot that draven so you didn't feel confident to go in yeah. and if you know you can't one shot you don't have your stop what you don't have a zonias or anything you're just going to die so you decide just to go for the poke the non-committal trade sitting around the edges getting a little bit of vision getting more information you know you can see where that valuing your life mindset really comes into play yeah making sure that you're not over committing playing with other people because they're going to be creating space for you mm -hmm. big shutdown and another thing by the way if I had more ult stacks, I would have been able to one-shot the Draven. And that's mm. that's like a different thing, like a different right. perspective of like approaching the skirmish, right? So if you like have, I, if you're I on only full have... stacks here. Yeah, if I'm on full stacks, like he's dead. But I cannot do that right now because mm. I, I'm not. Yeah, and this is kind of what we're aiming for. Just being that annoying champion sitting around the edges. And this is why fundamentally games like this where you have other people diving in whether it's a Nocturne or yeah. a Khan or whatever, makes your life so much easier. You know, when, when you're the only yeah. threat and you're versing Peel and CC like that of a Nautilus, it's very, very difficult. But if they're going to use it aggressively like this, I mean, yeah, I mean, this is very, very simple. And that's basically it for this one. So yeah, very patient skirmishing. So I, I think, you know, if we're just still distilled the learnings between, you know, this entire slide here. You know, a lot of patience... You know, the, the importance of playing with other members and using other members, I guess, to create yeah. space for you to go in with your R without getting one shot. Really thinking about your R stacks, you using your terrain scaling to both get in and out, utilizing Fog of War to sit around the edges and be annoying that way. Um, it seems to be a lot of kind of common common trends here. And then also understanding the consequences of committing to a skirmish. You know, there's the no cost roams yeah. and then the high yeah. cost roams, things that we need to consider moving forward before committing to those skirmishes. Yeah, and also another thing that I have to mention is that these were kind of the only skirmishes in my 35 games that I recorded for the Castling Guide, right? So I am not skirmishing a lot. Mm -hmm. As you can see in the Talon game, I'm almost never like actually like fighting. Like there's very few times when I'm actually moving to skirmishes. Most of the time I will actually just take my plates, take my waves, like get value in my lane, get vision, get whatever, right? And then, like, when it's very good for me, like, in this case, this skirmish is not great for me, but as you can see, like, I'm extremely, incredibly behind. And the game's really, really hard at this stage. You're kind of forced to do yeah. so. Yeah, exactly. So, right now, I'm just, like, I'm 80 CS at 17 minutes. Like, I'm kind of in a very bad position, right? So, at this point, like, I kind of have to, like, mechanics max in a way. And it, just... it kind of feels like in your games, Alados, where it's like, it either feels like, there is never a kind of fight in the sense that you just farm, 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 and then you just make picks and you kind of win the game through picks. Or it's kind of like you farm, 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 and then there's like one big team fight later on, 
you know, and then that's it. it, it you're not really pl- casting it isn't really the sort of champ that's just looking for skirmish fight two v two, two v three, two v two, three. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's just not your champ's identity. So before we actually get into the team fights, Aldous thought it'd be a good idea to get into how to review team fights first. So walk us through, you know, what are we looking at here, Aldous? Yeah, so at the beginning, like team fights are like mostly like decided before the fight actually happens. So your preparation is key. And when you want to review your team fighting, when you want to review like how you fight, you have to consider, first of all, is this even a fight that I want to take? Do I have my item specs? Do I have my like two items, three items, whatever? If if you're like if you're sitting on gold for a button and you're fighting, you're trolling. Like you you straight up just anything. If if you have like level fifteen with eighty percent XP as we saw earlier, you're also inting. <laughs> Do you have flash? If you have flash in thirty seconds and you're mm. fighting, you're trolling as well. Right. You should fight around blue buffs as well. Uh, if you have, like, if you can, you should have a blue buff for fights because it's incredibly, like, it makes your life so much, so much easier. And then, obviously, if there's no objective to fight for, you should get waves. You should sometimes hover if if your team has a lot of, uh, like, if the enemy team has a lot of engage, right? But even then, most of the time, you will just want to get, like, as much resources as possible. So this is the first part. Is like, is this a fight I want to take? So this is kind of the what you meant part. before, sorry to interrupt, but this is kind of what you meant before when you were saying how in the last slide, when, you know, commonly one of the, the methods of reviewing that we use in the MLA is the micro, micro, then macro, right? But for Cassidy, yeah. it is flipped. You like to look at the macro. Is this even a good play to take before you even remotely get into yeah. the micro? Because chances are, yeah. and especially for the majority of Cassidy's, they're taking fights that you should never even be taking anyway. So you would recommend yep. for most people, don't even get into that micro yet. Like focus on, okay, am I playing in accordance with my key spikes? Am I tick- Am I actually playing in accordance with my key reference points? Focus on that first, yep. because, you know, reviewing the micro of a fight that's impossible, right? Try to try to fight at level 10 yeah. with uh, half an item or whatever the hell it might be. It's going to be impossible anyway. Yeah, and I think there's also... Like there are key takeaways mechanically as well, and we will get into that in a bit. But like approaching the fight and like actually like taking the fight or not is I think the biggest game changing decision for most custodian players mm-hmm. in my experience. Interesting. Okay. So yeah, second thing we get into is how do you actually approach the fight? This goes back to the low state assessment, threat assessment, role assessment, win con assessment. How do you want to actually fight? Sometimes custodian can front to back, right? Custodian loves flanking. If you can flank, that's great. How do you like how do you approach a fight? Like where do you take the fight? You usually want to like play around uh, uh, terrain so you can use your ults. Like Custodian has the best terrain scaling in the game, right? So you should definitely use your terrain as much as possible. You should fight in places where you can make use of your uh, terrain scaling. And you also want to like get your ult stacks up. You also want to like use fog as much as possible, like get access to the player that you have to like kill, right? So this is a very important uh, concept as well. How do you approach the fight? And then the third one is what's your actual role in the fight? And that's, that goes to like target selection, assessment of like key abilities. Do you have to wait for the like Maza Harold, for example? Do you have to wait for a TF card or whatever? Like that's gonna usually be CC. Or like Zaya ult. If if you're ult flashing on a Zaya and she has ult, and you don't one shot with just an ult W, like you will just die on the spot, and and it's gonna be very hard. So you have to be very mindful of like what your role actually is. Who do you have to kill? Do you actually have to kill someone? Do you have to peel? Do you just have to create space by like hovering in fog, or do you have to like one shot somebody? Do you have to peel? These are all things that you have to consider. What's your actual role in the fight? And regardless, these are good questions to ask yourself in the review. So basically, you know, to be clear, these are things that you would recommend Cassidans ask themselves when they're trying to review and get max value out of their reviews in the team fight specifically. Exactly, right. exactly. And also I would recommend if you're like learning Cassidin and you're like, I don't know, silver, gold, plat, whatever, you should focus on one of these. You should focus on, okay, I'm going to like focus on me like choosing the right fights and then you would assess like every fight how you actually like 
think about it and not really worry too much about like your role in the fight or like how you approach it and then like go one by one because it's it seems to be a lot more effective because then you're like learning objective and what you have to think about even in the game is very very clear yeah even right? just starting with do i like am i at my key artist spikes and do i have my key level spikes like yeah. that's it and then start with oh, okay what did i consider yeah. flashes am i aware of who has flash do i am i aware of who have exhaust you add that layer the way it's like it's just building blocks right these are all layers you know, at the end, exactly. when you're getting to Grandmaster and you're getting to Challenger, these are things that you're basically always able to think about. You're able to simultaneously identify everyone's power spikes, uh, you know, who on your team is strong, if they have exhaust, if they have MR, you know, you're, you're able to assess all this stuff. If the game length is going to be long, short, do I even need this fight, do I not? But where someone is yeah. in gold, they're barely even going to be, they don't even know when they're, they're, they're themselves are strong. Right, so this is your spot on. Like, pick one of these things, pick one of these areas, and this would be a great thing to just learn one by one. And these are just the building blocks, and you can go ahead here based off your level and kind of pick what thing you want to fo kind of focus on in the review. The second half is the execution, which I think, like, most of the fights are like like the micro macro perspective, right? The this is like the macro perspective that we started with, and now we get into the micro and. Here I want to give you some reference points for Cassidy specifically, especially like high quality questions that you can ask yourself, which is how do you actually execute? If your target selection and like everything is in place, your execution will be, have you actually gotten all your W's off? Have you actually used your W's or like, have you timed your ults with your W usage? Because if you ult in without W and you don't get the W proc, like you might just die because you will not have mana again. Your W is extremely important in fights. So you you always have to like get those Ws off. That's why many champs that can avoid the Ws, like the Nyla, like the Jax, the the Samira, like no, not the Samira, sorry. The, yeah, but the Jax, the Nyla, champs that actually can like the Shen W, those stuff actually prevent you from getting mana back. And usually they use up your W. So it's it's incredibly important to think about how do you get your Ws off because that's the key to success in fights. The second thing, have I landed all my ults and E's? This is just the mechanical part of it, but aiming the ults and E's can be very hard. Like I, <laughs> when I hit Master T, right? One of my key mistakes that I was doing almost every game is I just missed E's. Like I just missed so many E's and it was disturbing. <laughs> So yeah, that's also something that you have to be very, like, if you feel like you're missing ults or missing ease, that's something you should be focusing on. Okay, how do I place my ult? Like, how can I, like, caster in ult, even if somebody is scripting, is undodgeable. You cannot dodge it unless you use an ability. So as long as you aim it correctly. So you should always look to, like, learn your aim around the ultimates, around the ease, because they actually make the game so much easier if you can like do them well. This is the same thing with like the max range ults into ease, which you will do in fights a lot, but it's like you're just playing on the max range of your E and just like getting some poke off while using your ult as mobility. And yeah. Um, should I have been more patient with anything? That also comes back to your ults, as we talked about in the earlier clips. Like you have to be very patient with your ability usage in many of these fights, skirmishes, and everything. The next one is, did I play around my key abilities in the fight before pulling the trigger? Like, do, do you have your ult stacks up? Do you have the... Like, have you waited the W for uh, getting mana back? Have you waited the Q if you actually need to, like, uh, fight an ASOL, for example, that's channeling Q? Like, you need your Q to actually cancel that, right? So these are also very important to think about. And the last one is, was my camera control good? It, as Kasserin, you're very, very mobile. So like having a very good camera control in fights is incredibly important as well, because you can easily like get from one side of the screen to the other. And if you can't follow up with the camera and actually like collect all the relevant information, it will be incredibly difficult to actually like consider everything and win fights consistently. All right, we're going to start off with roasting an MLA member, Hashiwa. I know he's going to be rolling in his grave here, um, going over this one. But this is a great example of bad team fighting. 
So I know Hashiwa, you're bursting out laughing. Um, but <laughs> we gotta show it. We gotta show it. we gotta show the masses what bad team fighting looks like. <laughs> so this is what bad team you know, so so look, the good thing he's on three stacks, right? He's on three, that's good. I think that's a positive. Um yeah. Oh, the missed E. Okay, let's this... we have to so what we'll do... Let's just look at it and then let's analyze. Yeah, we'll watch, the... it, we'll watch it play it out in full and then we'll kind of go through yeah. all, the, all the little things. Okay. So that's the that's the team fight. So let's go through each and every little mistake here. So let's actually first critique so, the positioning. No. No? Where do you want to start? The first critique is he's 200 gold away from Roboto. Wow. He's literally next to Roboto. Like, he should never take a fight here. Like, okay, they are on the Baron. He has to zone it, kind of. But he never wants to team fight. He wants to get this, get them off of the Baron and back away, get his Baron, uh, robot on and then fight. He has TP as well. He's quite, quite strong if he gets that, right? So that's the very first critique. Like, this is not a fight you want to force. Like, this is great. Now you should ping it off ping and back go to... and get the hell out of here. Yeah, exactly, exactly. If we can even get to level 16, that'd be good as well, right? The, lo the closer we get to level yeah, yeah, 16 yeah. as well. Yeah, but he has Electrocute here. So items are the biggest spikes in a way. Yeah, so that's the first one. Second one is the approach of the fight. Like right now, I think at the beginning, like he should look to like find a flank because he's not playing a very, like he's not level 16 where he can like just ult every second like twice. And he's also not like as fed as to like one shot anyone on the game. So he should definitely not be standing there, but actually like try to like walk around the- Like over there, loot behind. Not even that way, I think just like around his team and just like try to like close on the enemy like behind the actual like where he ulted over to the Rakan, right? Over the um, like mid wall. Now he's walking to the right way and if he walked here earlier, he could now have like a form and ult flank on the bush, mm. right? With the crown, he actually survives that like 100% and then his team could have cleaned up. But since he came here late, he does not actually find like a flank. He does not actually find the the angle to like kill people. He also will b like burn his crown on the Rakan, miss his E, which is the mechanical misplay part. And then, I mean, at this point, the fight is kind of over because he's not reaching his key targets. He's not actually like he misses his ult here as well. I think. Yeah, I think he misses R there. I think he even yeah, missed. So... so I think he. Was that the E yeah. damage? I think he hit one. Yeah, that's the E. One time. And yeah, that's, uh, that R is just like going between like a a five and R and it doesn't hit anyone. Yeah. See? Yeah. So but, yeah. But regardless, he, he's not even able to get on any key targets here anyway, right? He's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, if he got on the Kindred, I think he could have killed the Kindred with like well, WQ and get out with the Seraph, get like um, mm. something. But mm. yeah, I mean, like this. It's like the worst case scenario, right? So it kind of showcases like what kind of mistakes you can make. Here he also like he ults, but the ult misses because the Rakan flashes it, and now the fight is kind of over. So this is a great example of, you know, there are mechanical and micro issues, right? With the I and the E's yeah. and, and things yeah. like that. But those are actually kind of small in comparison to the macro stuff, isn't it? The positioning. Right. Exactly. And like, exactly. The, and all the other things, like the yeah, you're 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 not really flanking, getting onto the back line. You're not yeah. really getting max value out of your crown here. You know, these are the yeah. things that matter more in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. So. Yeah. Basically, like, in this situation, what I taught Hashiva because he actually bring this word to me for like a coaching as well, yeah. was that yeah you have to think about your Abaddon first. Like that's your first thing that you have to think about. And the next one is how you approach the fight, because that's where I think most of this fight actually went wrong. Mm. And then after that, like there's a mechanical execution part where it's like, okay, he missed an ult, he missed an E that all could have won the fight basically. Well, let's contrast this with some actually, uh, some decent quality team fighting here. So this one is you. You have actually gone the Luden setup with the with the Electro. 
Yeah, I think we actually looked oh, at yeah, this so already. We actually this looked is... at this one, but let's actually, I think this was a really great example. So we, I think we spoke about this in the R usage, I, or I believe, right? So yeah, you yeah. Know, we, we highlighted the, the significance of getting, you know, to three stacks here and, and sitting on the three stacks here and milking it rather than rushing into the fourth stack here. But I think, you know, the great thing here, if we can contrast it with the last one, even at a high level, I mean, you're yeah. not really close to any spikes, right? Yeah, no right? spikes. No spikes. We're in a great position. We have complete backline access. I have the full flank. My team is coming from the opposite direction. So I always have a flank. Yep. I'm always threatening. And they always have to play around my presence. And then I'm still, I'm just patient. I'm just waiting. And this is also like how I approach the fights. I approach it from the flank. I approach it from like a good position. And then that's my target selection. I kill the ADC. Then I fight with my team because the rest of the fight is just me like having to fight with my team, right? And then we can clean up the rest with mm -hmm. everyone. And then we can get the Baron, right? Yeah. So after this, it's very simple stuff. Yeah. I think we actually lost this fight at the end. Yeah. So <laughs> From we, like the most disturbing Baron call. Well, but... I think this one was a, a great example of now, you know, your your health is compromised. And then also yeah. like you, you just don't have reliable backline access here. And you also don't really yeah. have, yeah, you don't have time to get into a good position here. These are situations yeah. that are actually very hard for you as a cast in, right? Because you've made the play, right? You've killed them. Yeah. Right. But because yeah. you've actually played for the fight and then you got chunked, especially I think it was around here. I, I, I mean, yeah. you get chunked by the Syndra. Now fighting as a Syndra with only two items, you know, it's just quite difficult. This is really quite difficult. Yeah. Also, a big problem with Castorin is that you don't have a lot of objective DPS. So mm -hmm. you might be able to like kill people very effectively. And you see here, I'm using my terrain scanning. If Syndra ever stepped close to that wall, mm -hmm. I would kill her. Like I'm, I'm looking for those threats, but yeah, uh, if I can't find it, it, it might just be very unfortunate. Yeah. Now everyone leaves the pit and it goes and then into the And then you're also sitting on four stacks. So this is really awkward, right? Cause you had to get your stacks up here as well, but then now you're sitting on three stacks, but the fight's been elongated. So now you're sitting on four stacks and you're like, oh shit, do I yeah. stay on the four stack stacks or do I let it run out? Because this way it gets yeah, really, yeah. really tricky. I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean, here it's like, I can't really do anything but peer now because if I use ult once, I'm like, yeah, you just I'm use done. This. Yeah. But yeah, I don't like this call and then I get drink sorted and then. Yeah. 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 All right. So let's get into another good example. This one again, sitting around the edges. Again, utilizing yeah, that terrain I, scaling. Yeah, I find the, like, I have the terrain scaling. I have the flank. I have the crown to, like, block damage. This is where crown I, really comes in handy, right? Yeah, exactly. This is also like the tank setup, right? So. So even if like I don't have crown at this point, I don't have crown. I can still like go for the fight and just clean it up completely without actually being yeah like really killed, right? So this one has multiple elements. I mean, the first one is obviously really good positioning, right? You're setting yeah. up. I mean, you're spiked and ready to go. You're at you know we're 32 minutes in the game with a full build, so we're incredibly strong here. You know we've yeah. actually got because of that positioning, we're able to get complete backline access and get directly onto the Heimerdinger here. And basically get him to yep. you know 10 percent hp within the first second and a half and then because you've gone through the tank setup and you've got the crown you can go in there without being afraid of getting one shot and that really allows you to to stay in combat get the seraph shield and then clean up so this one is a combination yep. of good macro and good micro yeah pretty straightforward here's another yep. one so to get, i think it's important to identify the setup this one we have the crown and uh and uh Can set up with the conqueror yeah. yeah with conqueror and we don't have our third item we're not even remotely close to our third item here yeah also that's the thing that i want to mention is that oftentimes if you're against like magic pen and like lethality champs having a cloth armor and a null magic mental sometimes is a lot more valuable than any of the actual mm -hmm. like bigger components mm -hmm. of the either abyssal mask or the frozen heart so i i like going this kind of setup very often but yeah. Okay. So this one, we kind of went in for a bit of a chunk and then Jace comes yeah. back in. So we try to re-engage here. We get a nice little bit of a re-engage. This is kind of going in, going out. We've actually got yeah. our four stacks still available here. We'll see what you do with your R stacks. I will definitely wait for them to reset. Cause if I, if I don't reset them, I will only have like two words. Mm -hmm. So now like in this fight, mobility will be key for me because I'm, I want to play it slowly, but like elongated. Mm -hmm. So if I only have one word or two words. Since I'm not an assassin setup, my job is not one-shotting, actually. My job is just using my ease, using my 
like abilities to actually create space mm. to like chunk people like down slowly and surely and be annoying and then in and out like yeah yeah, yeah exactly so you, now you i can, i think before we even get past this point i think we gotta we gotta really highlight what you've done here right to make it clear it looks like you're before this point you your three members were dead here and the enemy were threatening dragon so your mindset here was actually your role in the fight was to basically play around the edges buy time for your team to come back up yeah, such that yeah. you can actually contest the dragon on the back end so right now because no one's low enough for you to one shot and no one else is here you don't want to stay on four stacks you want to reset your stacks and then you can actually now use your mobility with your r and then just go in and out yeah and you see like they kind of like turn on me and that like creates like so much time for us to actually like not give the trick hmm. my team actually gets into position to like like start fighting it and now I can, like, now I can look to, like, play with my team. And still, like, I'm thinking about, okay, there's the Tariq E and there's the Gragas E, right? Those are the two things I'm thinking about. And here, my Jarvan gets a very good engage. But if I go in now, I would either get stunned by the Tariq E or the Gragas E. Gragas E's, I immediately go in. I get the backline. Dude, this is and... just so beautiful. This team fight is insane, Alados. This is so, this is, like, the epitome. This is, like, a combination of playing to the limit of your setup, but also understanding threat assessment perfectly. Like the way you play this in and out is just such high level. Well, first things first we got to talk about here is, you know, you let your stacks reset, your team then starts the dragon. We, we get a bit, of, a bit of a chunk, but we could have, we have one yeah. stack there. We can kind of play on the edges, get our second stack. Javan gets a really good engage, but if you go in, you're just going to die, right? You're probably going to yeah. get like body slammed or Tarek stunned or knock up by Yasuo. You're just going to die there. Cause there's no other multi-thread yeah. there, right? So then we sit, we go back out, we wait, Gragas goes in, we identify there's two low targets on the back end, flash over the yeah. Gragas directly onto the back line. Yeah, we we'll flash into the back line and then we clean up the fight and very, this will actually give us the trick. Very, very clean team fighting. And this is kind of, again, the understanding, this is poise, right? This is knowing your limits. This is playing in terms yeah. of your setup. This is being aware of your, your role in fights being aware of your teammates location this is kind of the pinnacle of what kind of class and team fighter can be if all these things are tied together although i think i missed a lot of ease in this fight so i like even this fight had many many misplays right but the overarching concept actually is there which is you want to play around threats around your spikes around like good setup and then around your identity with your setup so now we're going to be talking about commander mindset. Now, commander mindset has been a concept that has been used in my coaching for a very long time. And essentially, commander mindset is this idea that if you are the carry or you're in a very advantageous position, it's your responsibility to take control of your environment, the people around you, to let them know what you want. Because if you're the carry, if the game is played around you, you need to give them a heads up about what you want. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to listen but at least you're going to be influencing or I guess increasing the chances of winning or the likelihood of winning by giving them information about what you want because you're the person that knows the most about what you want. You can't assume that people around you know exactly what you want. So we're going to go through a clip of Alados using the commander mindset to effectively win a game. To give a bit of context, we're in the late game here. Very strong Luden's build. You even see in chat here, wait my blue for the fight with fight. So he's waiting here at the blue buff, literally chilling, made it very clear, you know, with typing that he doesn't want anything to happen. Just wait my blue. I need blue buff. So then he stays yeah. here, gets the blue buff, pings the elixir, and we're going to watch it from here. Yeah. So now, obviously, like, I'm, I'm thinking about a lot of my, okay, how do I win this game? What's my job? I'm typing I'm like Exodia now. We can actually fight, like win any fight on the planet if we actually take it well. And I will get the mid wave out so it doesn't push into us. Like we are in a very, very strong position. We have you typing. I'm you typing wait, wait my, my flash. flash. I have 48 seconds on it. That's very, very key for me. Like if I have flash, that changes the way fights play out for me. So I'm not going to look for a fight actively. And then we say I'm force typing force at Nash. I want to play around the terrain. I want to actually like, yeah. Yeah. I'm typing need to day, use terrain scaling. Cassidy can't fight in the base. It's so hard for Cassidy to fight in the base here, right? Like, you know, you need to be using yeah. neutral objectives as a magnet to make them come into you so you can actually 
um, yeah. get onto the back line. Yeah. yeah, so I got this blue. And now we just back off here. We will fight at the Baron. I will not go for fights before the Baron. I'm not going to look for anything. I'm just going to hover my team so if there's an opportunistic skirmish or anything, like I can one shot somebody. And now I think let's go to the Drake and fight there. And now we get into a position where I have my blue, I have my flesh. We have we are like ready for a fight. And now it's all about like how we actually like play the fight and how we execute, right? So Zaya gets his item now. And I don't really have anything I can buy. I think I just like refresh my potion. And then Warwick pings a Warwick is actually Broxa here. Like he pings a fight, but it's like we just go in and here I'm just pinging it off and my body language is going away. Mm. He pings it in like three times. I'm pinging it off. I'm not even looking for the fight. I know my Zaya is in base, right? Like she went back, but you have to take control. Like you have to be taking in all the variables. You have to understand what's happening. And if we fought there like a 4v5, we might actually have lost the game. And now with the Zaya here, like we can actually like, again, this is going to be a very good like Astrid in team fighting example of like, what's your job? And I mean, has a very fat Syndra. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hover out of vision and look for a pick. I'm going to look for an opportunity. I'm stacking up my ults. Now it's 640. Now I can actually look for a pick on somebody. I see the Syndra hovering and then boom, Syndra is dead. And now the team fight is going to be a lot more straightforward because now the team fight is actually kind of over. And look at that. And from here, it's like easy cleanup. So with really good poise, good communication. And if you had taken that fight back here with Broxa, you know, with your AD carry basing. You would have lost the game. You would have lost the game straight up. Yeah. And that's very important as well. Not in, not just in the late game, in the early game as well. Like so many ganks, so many skirmishes, so many stuff. You have to ping off and you have to commit to not doing it. Because right now, if I'm like still like hovering, if they go in or something, like I will be there. Like my body language will like signal them that I want to fight. But by me walking away and pinging away, they realize, okay, it's not a good fight and they can disengage. So that's very important as well. So there's three forms of communication in Solo Queue for those of you watching who don't know. There is typing, which Alanos used. There's pinging, which Alanos used. And the third one is body language through your movement. So back here, right? Notice how he literally just didn't, he didn't walk towards the fight. He walked away from the fight. He did the combination of spam pinging, Zaya and <laughs> chat said, wait me, but he just literally walked away, made it very, very clear that we did not want this fight. So you want to maximize yeah. all of the ways that you want to communicate, um, ideally in solo queue to influence the behavior of your teammates. So we're getting into fog of war. You know, we, we've briefly touched on this throughout the guide so far. We're going to go through a few examples of how Alados uses this fog of war. So this is another example. This time he kind of TPs all the way on bot side, utilizing that terrain scaling to, to hover around the edges. And look, this is probably one of the aspects of Cassidy that has like an infinite skill cap. You know, there's an infinite amount of yeah. creativity that can be done. Um, so we're just going to take a look at a few examples here. So this one, he, he, it looks like you had a bit of like a an insight into that. Okay, well, if Lucian's covering bot, someone might be collapsing onto the Lucian. Yeah. And, so yeah. you're kind of using that as a bit of bait here. To kind of potentially yeah. Also, like, yeah, I'm. You can see, like, I'm using the ult, like, stacking it up, and then by the time the Draven is here, I actually just have the damage to like one shot him mm -hmm. with my fully stacked ult, right? So this is also very good, like, usage of fog. You should, like, you should try to walk around the, like, the bot lane thing to that, like, that bush where I kill the Draven from, because you can get into that bush as Casterin very easily. You can use your sweeper. And many people will actually walk to lane. Like so many people, even in like GM challenger, like they will just do it sometimes. And like recalling there has no cost <laughs> in a way. If you would actually want to recall, but I just wanted to go for a pick and it exactly happened. And this allows us to actually like get a lot of stuff. It gives me my, my stack on my treasure hunter and it's, it's very good. So yeah, Same. this is a different one. Here I will use my fog of war. I'm hovering out of vision to actually like find a flank on the key targets and get a very nice big amount of damage off. And use my crown obviously to like not die from it, which allows us to actually only get a pick here. 
But that's completely fine because that allows us to actually take the dragon that's spawning in like 10 seconds. And you get so... double flashes there as well. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. And I don't actually have to use my flash, so it's very good. So this is uh, one where I'm just using terrain to avoid vision. So we see that ward there. So I'm just going to avoid that ward to like get a flank position on the Varus. Mm -hmm. Which will give me a very, very nice creative pick here. Wow. Yeah, guys, this is kind of, you know, Alodus is showing us what's possible with Cassidy from a terrain scale. This is why it is, you know, infinite, this is infinite, infinite skill expression here. Yeah. Okay, this is big, so, especially now since the sweeper changes, right? So the sweeper nerf a little bit, yeah. it's a little bit lower duration. So we're going to be a little bit more careful. Yeah, so right now I'm like, I'm actually moving into the river with sweeper. But it's a very bad sweeper because my team is not on the map. I actually have to play on the opposite side of the map. Like, if there's going to be a fight, it's going to be played on the top side. And since I didn't realize that, I will now not have sweeper for the top side fights. And I will not have, like, a way of, like, getting the perfect flank with a good sweeper usage and, like, finding a bush where I can, like, be to, like, one-shot somebody that's approaching is, the fight. Because this is where the next fight's going to be, right? We're not. There's no objective fight happening yeah, exactly. on the side. So if this is where the next fight is going to be, why the hell would we want to sweep on the bot side? Because now we're getting to a position yeah. right now where we want to be setting up our flank, but now we can't set up a flank because we don't even know if we're going to be spotted on vision, right? And that's the danger of using sweeper poorly. And this is a really nasty habit. I've actually noticed it myself when I play support, just getting really sloppy and not intentional with sweeper. So, you know, this is a bit of like a, yeah. a reminder of all of you out there. If you're going to play Cassid and you're looking for those picks, you've got to be intentional with that sweep and actively thinking, where do I want to set up my flank? Where do I want to you know, really get into position. All right, I'm going to talk about tempo a little bit. So on this clip, we can see that I'm already pushing the wave. We already got the good trades. We can get the dive here. Like almost always, I have level 6 advantage. I can get my trades off. Kiana is kind of doomed right here. Like I can just get my ult auto and she's dead. And now this is the moment when you can do two things, right? We have multiple options. We can either go there and chop the next wave that's coming in. We can take the reset, and we have multiple choices. Now, since Kiana is one of those champs that if she gets a lot of tempo, she can actually influence the side lanes, create like very good skirmishes. Here, I actually just take the reset and get my items. And if, if we fast forward a little bit, by the time Kiana is back in lane, I'm going to be back in lane before she can actually escape the lane to like create a good opportunity. So this is a very important concept because by actually respecting tempo and just just taking the reset fast enough, you can prevent your opponent from having a completely free turn and killing your bot lane. Alright, here's the second clip of the tempo clips. And in this clip, we actually get a peek on the mid laner from a skirmish. And I'm getting back to lane, I cleared the pink. I will get my wave. Uh, we just E it. Uh, this wave is very separated, we just wave clear it. And now in this moment, I have a choice, right? Like, I can reset, and my reset will take 8 seconds, and he's on an 8 second death timer. So right now, if I reset, I will be back in lane at the same time as him. But since I'm not really afraid of Varus' roams, and like Varus influencing the game as much, I actually don't value my tempo extremely highly here. I will actually go for the plates, I will go for the more greedy play, actually getting my... Uh, getting my gold, getting my next wave and in a way sacrifice tempo for like immediate resources and the better item spike whatever right so this is the moment where like you have to be very mindful what kind of mid laner you're playing against and when you want to trade tempo and when you don't want to trade tempo we also can see that there's no real objective on the map so even if i'm late now nothing will happen like i can i can just like go for the plates and be behind in tempo because it doesn't matter in this game getting into flash usage here so this is an example of not having flash post six completely changing the matchup so in this case you were limited because you didn't have flash right here i'm playing into tf and right now like what i want to do is i want to wait for my ult to reset so i can take those like ult in eq traits get some value, but I cannot actually ult in because I don't have flash. Like I don't have the luxury of like ulting in. 
because if I have flash, I can take those aggressive trades. I can like look for like the old EQ trades, block the damage with my Q, and even if the jungler is nearby, I'm still completely fine. I can ult away, I can flash away if I need to. But now I can't play the fight actually. Like I cannot stomp my lane as much as I would like to because I don't have flash. And the right. threat of the flash is absolutely massive. Because right now the Imagine threat I is get... a gold card, right? If we don't yeah. know where their jungler is, jungler sitting behind. If you have flash, you probably have enough with flash, flash out, R, yeah. you could probably have enough, create enough space to get the hell out. But because you don't have flash, yeah. it's limiting the trades you can take versus these high CC champions because you just don't have that safety. And that's not the only thing, right? Like, even if I get the trades off and even if I win the trades, like, if I have flash, my threat is off the roof. Like, if I just take one or two good trades, TF can never walk up to Tin the Wave again. Like, he can never walk up for that cannon. Like, he can never do anything because I'm, like, just way too threatening having flash. But here I don't, so he actually gets away with, like, farming the entire wave, kind of. And this is an example of how having flash changes positively what we can do. So we take a very good trade here at six. Yeah. And because you have the threat of the R flash, you know, yeah. I mean, and then, I mean, you had the threat of the fire, the R, sorry, you can, you can, yeah. uh, you can kill. And then now because you yeah. actually have your flash, your kill threat range look is at, massively yeah. extended. And look at this fight. Like, look at like how patient I am with like not using old flash here. Like, I think many people would have already old flash like long ago, but I know like how much my flash is valued in this lane, especially in this lane state that I will just be completely poised with using it. And then like a few seconds later, I, I find an angle of like, okay, I will stack my ult up a bit and then I will just E flash into ult W and I get a kill because I, I kept my flash on the, the skirmish because I kept my flash earlier. Hmm. And I didn't lose it in the early game. That's what makes this like possible. So this is an example of grant flash granting access into the back line here. So let's take yeah. a look at this one. Oh, so this is actually this is the, the one we took yeah, a look at before, yeah. right? Yeah. So we we we'll kind of skip yeah, through this because yeah. we, we we looked at this before, but this was an yeah, example yeah. So, of yeah, because you had it, you were able to go for the R flash onto the back into the back line and assassinate them. Otherwise, if you didn't, you would have had to probably yeah. play the fight a little bit slower and probably play to kill the Gragas. Yeah. And then you know peel with your team but because you have flash it changes completely you know what your champion is capable of doing yeah exactly <laughs> same example so we have another example for this and this is uh i think this is a like both like a good thing and this is actually this is a mistake i mm, wanted to this is hashiva like, again using him this is hashiva <laughs> again and uh this is also something that we worked on with hashiva already but you you see like this Flash is atrocious. Like, it's the worst, you know? Why is that? Look at the objectives on the map. There's nothing. But when the objectives will actually come up, the flash will be down now. And even if he gets the kill, it's a kill. But it's only a kill. And as Kassadin, like, just a kill without, like, some consequence value, like, I would not just ult flash in lane to kill someone unless I can get, like, a wave crushed good tempo or something because if i cannot fix my wave and i flash ult, like i like 300 gold is nothing in a way like it's just not enough like even if he gets this skill it's yeah it's lee bad. sin would had to would had to have a big shutdown for this to be worth it exactly right? yeah exactly. It, look if if you are really far behind you know this is the sort of play that you could probably go for or if they had a big bounty right but in most games, if, yeah. if you're not going to get, if you're just getting the kill and you're getting nothing else and you're burning your flash, you should probably be second guessing it in the review. Look at, okay, this is what I say to a lot of clients. What were the consequences of you not having flash after this? Look at the scenarios that might have been able to play out a bit differently if you had flash. It's a really, really good yeah. habit to get yeah. into in your review process. Especially like with already saw, like they have Victor. Like if you play Kassadin, you need the backline access. Like you need the flash. Like yeah. you need it. And this is this is an example of you holding it. This is an example where you could have gone in for the kill with your flash, but you decide not to because you know that it's a low value kill. There's no objectives up. You don't exactly. need to go for that kill and you actually were able to conserve it. And this was a good job of not using flash as well. Um, here, I think this is another example. Let's take a look here. So we TP in. Here, like I could ult flash that Cled and kill him, right? I could old flash kill him and get out easily. But we already won the fight. 
So it doesn't change anything. Like, it literally doesn't change yeah. the game. You're already six and one. Yeah, exactly. You're already fair. So, it does nothing. Yeah. Yeah, we still got the Herald, we still got like mid prior, top prior, we get every wave, we get everything, and I get to keep my flash for the next objective, which is the dragon coming up in two minutes. Which is massive. Like flash value is so incredibly insane. Sometimes early game, I will actually die and keep my flash. Like it's so insane how much value you get, especially level six, seven. It's it's like so massive. Like you have to really you have to really value it a lot. It's very good. So as a follow-up example, we're just talking about the importance of Flash. This is a concept that Alados has been exploring a lot. Uh, and this is an example of where, you know, we could kill the enemy with Flash, but we're actively choosing not to kill the enemy because we know that we're going to get all the farm and we know that they're in yeah. a bad position, but we also know that yeah. we're going to be able to keep our Flash. So walk us through this. Yeah, so... In this matchup, usually, Kasserin is the one being poked out early on, like, pretty hard. And the Zerat actually missed, like, base opportunities, and now he's kind of stuck in lane, with no mana, with no ability to pressure me. So, the usual lane goes with Zerat, like, getting perfect CS, and Kasserin missing, like, one or two CS per wave from, like, the amount of pokes Zerat can do. But now, since the lane state is so favorable for Kasserin, Zerat can never, like punish me on any CS, really. I get every CS I want. And the best thing about this is, I could always kill the Zerat at, like, with Ult Flash. But what that would do is, it would give me 300 gold, fine. But the bad thing about it is, it would also like reset Zerat, and she, like he could come back to lane with the home guard and whatever. And the lane state would be reset to a position that's way less favorable for me. So actually here, like my lane tendency of like me getting every CS that are missing a lot of CS and I'm scaling way better you than him. You get net more, like more gain. Like he yeah. loses more yeah. in a way because you gain more by him losing more, if you will. Yeah. And I also like the thing is, right? Like me keeping this kind of lane tendency here, I make a mistake. Like the end of the play is kind of bad. Like we just both die. Yeah. Uh, Zerat gets a level up and mana for E. But the concept of this is that my flash... Actually, even, like, if I can kill him, like, it might just be more worth just keeping him in this, like, bad lane state for him, because the lane state, every single second that gets spent in this lane state, increases my chances of winning, like, right. incredibly. I see what you mean, because what you're saying is that if you were to kill him, he's then being able to replenish his resources, spend his gold, and then make the lane hard for you, because this is a matchup that typically is quite difficult for Cassidy in the early game because yeah. he can bully you. Yeah. So if you're ever in a scenario in, in a, versus a hard matchup where they're low on resources and you and they're not getting farmed, that's like insane because any world yeah. which you're getting free farm in this matchup is like insta win, right? Yeah. So maybe an argument could be made if this was an easy matchup anyway, it wouldn't matter, right? I like because like at the end of the day, you're gonna have control regardless of whether they're yeah, or not. Yeah. But in a hard matchup, like a matchup where you're gonna get bullied and where you're able to just free farm like this, it's it's favorable for you to elongate this scenario, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, if it was an easy matchup, right? Like easy matchups are good because like in easy matchups you can actually replicate incredibly good lane tendencies and that's why they are extremely good, right? Right. You can freeze the wave on your side, get like one or two good trades and then yeah. build a huge wave and dive them on it and then they are out of the game, yeah. you get the kill. So it doesn't plates, matter whether the they stay in lane here or not because you're always going to be in a favorable situation anyway. But what you're saying, yeah. because yeah. the matchup is hard, yeah, it makes sense to me, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so... This is obviously point, quite like, advanced, I would say, for the average Kassadin, yeah, but it's, it's something it's for the really higher level Kassadins that they might want to think about. So now we're getting into the reviewing framework here. Walk us through this. So we have a levels one to six. So, this, so what is this? Is this kind of like what people should be looking for at certain parts of the game? Yeah. Or like, walk us through this. How, do, yes. how does one make sense of this? So there are many types of reviews you can do, right? Like you can review your learning objectives and stuff. And like this is like how you would identify your areas that might be lacking in this case. So like... The first one is like level one to six. If your opponent hasn't roamed, influence the map, you have like even or ahead CS and you get a good reset, you won the lane, right? If that happened, you're like five minutes, you're uh, like you have all the influence and it didn't influence the map, you're even ahead in CS, like you won the lane. You don't have to look at your early game. That's that's when you don't have to look at it. Because even if you miss opportunities, whatever, like if you're in that position consistently, you're fine. 
Next thing is harder matchups. Being down only a few CS is still a win. If they roam and you get a plate and a good reset, fixed wave, that's that's a good stuff as well. You have to like understand that there's a lot of value in that. And sometimes you cannot prevent it. But if you use it to the fullest, like those situations, that's great. And you should almost never skirmish pre six. So if you see yourself like fighting in river or dying to a gank or like dying to your jungle's gank and being 1v2 or something or a counter gank, those are all things that you should like, they should raise a red flag in your mind. Like, mm, okay, something's going wrong here. I think a generally very good way to like identify where your level one to six goes wrong is you should look at the first wave, like how you approach it that we already covered. You should look at the value of your health, like how well you keep your health until the wave actually crashes. And then the third one is like, how do you actually play the bounce? Which is a bit more advanced, but if you are like, I guess D1 plus where they actually bounce waves very well, then you can actually like look into that and you can think like, okay, do I have to build a big wave to like crash into the enemy tower? Or do I have to like stand in the wave to make the enemy actually push the wave by hitting me with a skill shot and the wave, right? After that, if you if you get a good reset, that's great. The later, the better, usually, as long as you don't lose like significant amount of CS for it. If you do all of these things, your level like pre six will be fine. And if you don't do one of these, like let's say your level one is like chaotic, or you lose way too much health and you actually cannot take CS on the crash, like those are red flags that should like basically tell you that okay, there's something I have to work on here. Let's say we got to level six and we actually have our ult now. We can still like look to like we can look to make plays once we actually like got the waves, right? Like we have to value the waves extremely highly. If you lose a wave anytime, that should raise a red flag in your mind as well. Like, okay, I'm doing something wrong probably. How could I have gotten that wave or why did I lose that wave? Sometimes obviously, like sometimes you have to uh, give up a wave. But that's very rare. Like it's super rare. So you should always look to communicate first or be like mindful of like how you actually want to play the game. And if you still feel like you had to give up CS, then it might have been correct, it might have not been. But yeah. Generally you want to value CS super high. And you have you can in the level six to like swapping to the sideline. Like in that place, you can look at like how you actually play your trades, how you use your ults, how you use your Qs, your E's, how, like, what's your like quality of your resets, how well is your itemization, your spikes, all that kind of stuff. And you can also look at skirmishes because from level six, you can, you can kind of play skirmishes. You can play for like ganks mostly or like bot lane dives, whatever you can, you can, you have a lot of options. But yeah, those are what's actually are looking. I have a brain rot right now. I'm sorry. Can you <laughs> cut this part out? That's fine. Wait. So are we. So we did. You happy with this? For the most. Yeah. Part? Uh, for mo for the most part, I think the level six to bot lane is a bit. Yeah. If you can make a cut there, when I actually like. Yeah. Stumbled upon my words, that would yeah, be nice. And that's fine. And yeah, I think the the after bot swaps, I will just start talking in like five seconds. Okay. So yeah, and after bot swaps, you should like focus on mainly the skirmishes and the fights that we actually um, covered earlier in the guide, which is yeah, how do you approach them? All, all that we talked about. You can you already have the framework to like look yeah. at skirmishes and fights. So we're getting into matchups now. Everyone loves the good old tier list here. Now you've also included yep. some off meta non mid oriented champions as well. From what it yeah. seems like, um, in the, the bottom row, champs outside of mid to look for. Uh, look, at the end of the day, we're not going to sit here going through every single one. This is a, a good overarching framework, right? That they can kind of follow. Yeah. Um, if you guys have specific questions, maybe about things, I'm sure Alados is going to be floating around the comments and he can reply to comments yeah, here yeah. and there. So if you have comments about specific matchups, let us know in the comment section below. Um, is there any comments here that you'd want to have here, Alados, before we move on? I think like a few of them to highlight is that some of these matchups are extremely game dependent. Like the Leblanc is in an isolated, very favorable. You can block most of her damage with your Q. You can use your ult reactive. 
you can do a lot of stuff, right? If she ever Ws, you can W reactively and she will take more damage than you if you QW. But many of these matchups can actually get incredibly hard based on the game. So let's say, uh, like Leblanc, if she has a Jarvan jungle and you have a Shivana and she bounces the wave correctly, like suddenly the game is incredibly hard into Leblanc. Also, when there was the static shift Leblanc meta, that was also kind of hard for Kastorin because AD Leblanc is a bit more painful to deal with than AP. But yeah, uh, some other stuff as well is you might see some like unfavorable, very bad matchups that are like, yeah, those are kind of self-explanatory, but like Cassio, for example, can prevent you from playing the game, even if she's behind and she can bully you in lane. So some of the, like most of these matchups are actually like very hard to deal with. Now for champs outside of mid, but like these are some of the champs that are like, they have either very easy to land CC they are very movement restraining, like the Drakan has W, Ramos can silence you, I mean, uh, taunt you. Renata can prevent people from dying, which, since you're a very committed champ, once you're in mm. and you don't kill the target that you're trying to one-shot, like, you're gonna get turned on and you will die. Same with, like, Soraka and the Seraphine. Like, those are also champs that kind of do the same thing. Zillian as well. So, so some of these are, like, but you should look out for also globals like the Shenwood. Now playing from behind, when super behind, there are two ways you can be useful. First one here, you've mentioned Alados, be able to peel. We've kind of mentioned this throughout the guide, especially with the kind of the Conqueror style. You know, there is an element of kind of creating space for other fed carries just because yeah. you're behind doesn't mean the game is over. You know, if you've got a fed bot lane, there's always things that you could do to create space, whether it's sitting around the edges. And again, yeah. we've covered this in a lot of the team fighting clips. You see how Alados was able to play around the edges, especially that clip around the dragon, right? Where he was able to stall out that dragon play. You know, that's a classic example of where you didn't just go in and one shot someone, you were just dancing around the edges and creating space. So like you said here, play to peel, don't die, play for high percentage plays, keep poise and play for other people. But then on the flip side, have one shot threat, collecting one or two shutdowns can turn a game the round completely and the enemy has to play differently. And this is something that, you know, you said earlier on, I think it was in the build section about how, you know, sometimes, you know, when you're behind, your best bet is to literally build specifically to kill one person. You don't have to worry about anyone else. If you can just kill that one person, then that's it. Great. You just one shot one yeah. person yeah. or get someone to like 10% HP and that can be enough sometimes you yeah, win the game, yeah, even if exactly. you don't kill them. Yeah. Especially if they're of fed ADC, right? Like you, if you can ult flash, like kill somebody from like behind with a Ludens or whatever, it, it, it's over. Like you actually did your job way better than like many other champs would do in your position. So, and then you still like scale like incredibly hard. So you get a bit of time by getting a shutdown, by getting a one shot on somebody is Sometimes just what you need to like win the game. And right? you've got to follow that premise. When behind, build damage. When ahead, you can build. You have the luxury a lot of the time to build more defensive. Some final comments. Uh, I want to thank uh, everyone in the MLA that helped me, especially Hashiva. He sent me clips. He was like there. We reviewed a lot of games together, and he he helped me a lot. And we threw him under thank the bus guys. here with those bad team fight yeah. clips. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the bad, the bad plays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, uh, thank you for all of those. I'm I'm very grateful for you guys. Um, you helped me a lot. And I also want to give a shout out to Blitzer and uh, CloudV2. They helped me a, a lot with like talking about setups, about like builds, mindsets, and uh, share their perspective. And that also, I think, improved the guide a lot uh, in some ways. Also, if you want to ask about comment that we mentioned earlier, go to Blitzer stream. He can... Definitely and help I'll you put these it. links in the description below. Yeah, yeah. And also, if you want to watch very good Kassarin bots, I also can recommend TXZ or Duxiadin, who is like a Chinese uh, 1000 LP plus Kassarin player that plays on the super server most of the time. And his stream is also going to be in the description. And I right. uh, mean, thank you, Alados, ultimately. I mean, you put a lot of work into this. The stuff here that, you know, you have to be a, a Cassidy madman to figure out. And, you know, without you, you know, helping me put this together, there's no way we would have nearly the same quality of, of Cassidy guys. So thank you for taking the time. Um, beautiful. And uh, hopefully we can make some more Cassidy collaborations in the future. All right. So we have a Cassidy bot here. And 
uh, we're gonna talk about this entire game and just walk through like how the decisions are made and how you should be playing and also like highlighting mistakes that I might have made. This was like around like 600 LP EO West when I recorded this, so that's around the level of play. And you can see at the beginning I have first strike and Kane has first strike and I have a Kane and they have a Y. So we already see that these jumps, like Y wants a lot of early chaos where Kane doesn't really. At, and at the same time, Ori has Ignite Electrocute, so she also wants a lot of early chaos. She's very strong early on, like especially around like level 6 with the Vi, it's, it's a very, very, very strong 2v2. And I also have First Strike, which is not the most stable rune early game, but it's also very, very, very strong mid to late game, and it's, it's definitely gonna be the Assassin setup here, right? So, what we're gonna look to do is just avoid... A lot, like avoid creating chaos. That's that's our game plan. At the same time, I opted for the dark seer available, and um, because I can mitigate damage with my Q and we can play a slow laning phase. So that's what we will look to. Do. But there's a lot of chaos happening early on, even. So yeah, actually, let's look at the first wave. Let's go from the first wave. So we can already see Kane is kind of dying, kind of... Uh, he's kind of finding himself in a very bad type of chaos. I, I try to not lose health here, because we still like want to value our health very highly early on. And I also see that the minions will die at the same time, so I'm gonna level E level 1 and use it. Seems like bottling gets a kill too, and that's that's very nice. And now we're just gonna play play slow and steady. Let the wave like come into us. Always we we will just let the wave come to like push into us. And once it's on our side, now I ping the cane off to not hit the wave because if if he hits the wave and he ruins it, then I might find myself in a very bad situation where the wave is like shoving out to the enemy. But yeah. So here we, we still have the game plan. We just want to like avoid chaos as much as possible. But also just farming this wave under tower. And that's completely fine for us. And it seems like Kane doesn't have the same game plan. He's kind of looking for chaos. So I'm gonna communicate the Ari is moving and Obviously, at this moment, I can't. I cannot really move. Like, there's no way I can move here, right? I have to value my waves. I have to value value my entire game. So if I move here, that would be very bad, right? But the fight is going on for so long that I actually, yeah, I might decide to move to this. Although I should still not move. Like this is still bad for me to move here. This is the moment that we talked about. You should always spend your time like trying to. Like get value in your lane, especially pre six. Like this this wave state here. I could use this position to use the next wave to like actually crush the waves while Ori is bot lane. And then I could get a good reset. And we would have our early game ticked off. But I kind of went for this play, which which is a huge mistake because of this. Because we will see like Castorin doesn't really get done anything. And I'm even late back to lane, and now, yeah, I I could have taken a good reset or something, but now I can't anymore. So now I actually have to kind of stay in lane, and this is very bad because imagine I took a reset here, like that would be so incredibly amazing because I have my tier, it's a cannon wave, it will never get like pushed in, and I get back to lane, full health tier, having my first base without burning TP. And having also tempo over the Ari, so I could place this ward later, could place it a bit deeper as well, and just be in an extremely, extremely solid position. And what happens on the other hand is that, since I got the wave in, but this is a cannon wave, and now if I reset, I would have to TP. And I would not get a lot of value from buying items just yet, other than like if I can do it, obviously it's very good, but 
using my TP would not be as much value, so I'm just gonna stay in lane and... Kassarin at this stage cannot shove this wave in because it's a cannon and it would take a lot of time. It would just get stuck in here. So I'm just gonna kill it very slowly. And just... Just keep it there for the time being. As Ari comes back to lane, I can like look to like bait out a Q. Now this this raid is a big 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 mistake. Because now the wave could like actually go out and it could like go towards the Ari and it it actually does because of my E. My E usage here was very bad because I didn't realize that the wave if I don't touch it, Ari already queued once, so it would just come into me. But since I since I actually eat now this wave is kind of fucked, and this is the position that you want to avoid getting yourself into. The enemy like has the wave on their side; it's kind of freezing, and they have a high threat jungle, high threat, high threat mid laner, and you're not level six. Like this is very hard to deal with. In this position, since there was so much early chaos that the junglers are very behind in camps and stuff, I can actually like walk up here a bit because the V is level. Like, probably level 4 or level 3. So it's completely comfortable here. But at the same time, it's, it, it could have been very, very hard. Now again, like, this wave would come into me. Like, I'm just inting by using my E's like that. that that's a very, <laughs> it's a very low intensity play using my E's like that. But yeah, the wave crashes eventually. I will get my level 6. I can use my words. I will use it again to trade aggressively. Since my cooldowns are lower than Ari's cooldowns, I can actually trade like this, and it's completely fine. And now, I can actually try to like run her down. And this... Actually, what do you guys think? Is this Is this good? No, it's after it's absolutely atrocious. Like you should never die like this. The Drake is up, the strongest dragon in the game. I have such a like if I just take the trade, the trade was good. Until this point, the trade is absolutely great. From this point, I can either like flash immediately and auto attack to kill. That's a good play. If I flash auto and just kill her and fix my wave and do whatever. It's completely fine, it's great. But flashing while also dying and trading one for one is very very bad. Because now I will not have flash for the Drake fight. I have to use my TP and I cannot get like my actual items. So so this is very bad. I couldn't get Lost Chapter back here. This was a few patches ago. So here Lost Chapter was still like 1.3k instead of like 1.1k. But you see the point. Like you should never die like this because now... If I just kept this lane state after this trade, since Ari is an early game champion and I'm kind of scaling, and now this is one of the strongest moments of Ari in, in the game time at least. So if Ari spends this time, like, I don't know, like 6 to like 10 minutes, where she's like very strong with the V and like has a lot of threat onto me, like if she spends like any of this time, like being literally weaker than me, Losing minions, having a bad wave state, and having no influence over the map, no threat of like roaming with her ult or doing anything, and not even threat onto me like by poking me out because she's already way too low. Like just having her be in this lane state is more valuable than me using my flash and dying for one for one, right? It's very bad. Like here I'm literally winning the game if I just like keep that lane state, but now, now it became kind of even. Still not bad for me, but not great, right? But either way, we, we get back to lane. We start building a wave. This is the same concept we talked about earlier in the guide. You just want the wave to be on your side. Get one of these, like, old EQ traits. Get your first strike proc. Then you're very happy with doing that, right? You get a bit of gold. You get a uh, good trade, and you can slowly like start building an advantage doing this. Now here, I don't know where the V is, so it's a bit unfortunate. I can't really do like the kill play, but I can definitely like get a lot of minions, get a ward now. And we will play for probably the shove because 
Kane is around the bot side and they seem like they are looking for a play. But I feel like, again, I'm trying to... Now, like, waiting with my ult to B2, for B to show up. And now we see B on the map. So now I can actually, like, start looking for trades again. I got hit by the charm, but it's still alright. I still have two uh, refillables, so I'm doing great here. The lane is still fine, and I think every single time you're facing one of these champs that likes roaming a lot, you getting any of their HP will reduce their chances of roaming like so much. It's insane, right? You should always look to do that. Like, just like killing some of their HP so they can roam. Now, this is not a good play for me. There's a skirmish happening, and Ari has the first move. I'm pinging it off like five times here. But he still goes in, and this is this is what they call a compensation play. Me, I start moving, and this is very bad, right? Like, I should never move here. This is a bad play, play for Catherine. What do I want? What is my game plan here? I just want to get as strong as possible in the early to mid game, while not creating chaos around this 2v2, because we never win the 2v2, right? So now we actually go for the 2v2, and we get one, but I die for it. Kane gets the Herald, which is fine, but I think he also dies for it, yeah. So you see, this is a complete compensation play. What would have been the right play? Well, what is my game plan first, right? My game plan is to play an isolated 1v1, which I was winning very hard until now, and just not look for chaos. We could also, like, the right play to do in a situation like this is to call for objective trades. Because every single time the enemy like tries to commit resources, like commit the Ari and the B for like getting this Herald, you can actually just go out on the opposite side of the map and just get the other objective. So that would have been a way, way, way better play. Because that way we don't actually have to play the 2v2, we can just like trade one for one in objectives. And because I am winning mid lane and I can get priority, we should have done that. But since we actually did this one and I compensated for it, now the game looks a lot worse than it was. I got my chapter, I got my Kindle jump, and now I will start looking to actually start pushing. I want to get a deep ward out, and I also want to play with my jungler now. Because now this is the moment when you get like pretty strong in the game, and since I have tempo, I can look to like do whatever I want. I can get a lot of information, I can get something done, right? I just decided to place a very deep port on the enemy jungle, so if we spot the Vi either coming to the drake, or like going through the jungle or doing whatever, it's gonna be very very valuable. Now, I'm back to lane, I have not lost a single minion from this, so this was a great roam. And now we're just gonna look to not lose health, because there might be chaos coming up. That's why I'm not trying to trade health for health with the Ari. Now I get my wave, and now I'm gonna start to look for a move as well. They seem to commit to the dive. And it is still fine. Now, here we have two options, right? We can either go back to lane and farm the wave, get two plates. Or, we can choose to like go for the skirmish and actually try to get something from there. And now in this game, I make this decision to actually like move for the skirmish. Because... My teammates are like kind of all here, and if this skirmish goes very bad, then we will lose the drake, we will lose a lot, and they will also probably defend mid in time, so that would be like very very bad. But like like this, you see, this is another thing. I'm just using terrain scaling, like vision. I can also, like my Q will cancel the BQ, so that's also something you can absolutely do. We get a small pick here, we get back to mid lane. I was looking for an ult, uh, like an ult EQ angle, but I actually got immediately charmed, so I didn't think she would reactively, I mean proactively E here, I thought she was aiming at me, so that's my, that's why I got hit, she actually outplayed me with that one, and now that puts me on a very low HP, so now I actually have to find a reset angle, and I use my ult again, which was a huge mistake by the way. But yeah, and he's here to bail me out, and uh, yeah, I save for an extra wave and then reset. I actually opt for an Everfrost here, 
Now, what does Everfrost give me? Right, that's a, that's the question. Everfrost allows you to like take an ult in and e Everfrost Q. Right, like this combo, and that gives me more first strike gods, and that also gives me like a lot of utility. And they have so many champions, like uh, the V. They have um, the Ari. They have the Zeri. Like all of these champs, even Yumi, right? They, they all suffer if you ever like lock them down. And now, like in this game, I felt like Everfrost will give me a lot of that. The other strength of Everfrost is that you can E Everfrost the wave and get a way, 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 way earlier, like wave one shot spike. So, you can see, I can just E works. Again, look for a move on the bot lane, and since I have my terrain scaling, they can never escape me, really. And I use the dragon to actually, like, knock up the Yumi so she cannot ult to the... I mean, cannot jump over the wall. <laughs> That's very funny. And yeah. Here we have a little 1v1, but I'm very healthy, she cannot really kill me. t is also chasing her down. And now we have a situation where... We just want to get resources, we want to get to our spikes, we want to get to items, and the game is very... Like, you can see, the game stats is like sev like 16 to 7, right? And 16 to 7 seems like very bad, but in reality, I'm extremely winning here. Why is that? I'm in a very good position, I have a lot of kills, I have everything. The team comps don't look bad for me. They look slightly hard to play. Like, the V and the Yumi makes it very, very hard. Especially when they also have, like, Zeri, right? This is still fine for us, because we can... We have so much scaling on our team, that we're still completely okay with this. Again, like, there's a play, but I'm not gonna compensate this time. I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna get my item. I actually go Magi here, because I feel like I'm so strong, and it's so hard to kill me for the enemy team. That I can just play for Magi and I can just use Magi as like an offensive layer. Because <clears throat> if you feel like you can die easily, you should not buy Magi. But in this game, I can play such a... Like, I can I have so much threat on my team. Like, I have the Kane, I have Annie, like, using the ult. I have even Zaya. Like, everyone has so much threat that it's very, very unlikely that the enemy can just commit, like, V ult into, like, Ori charm into, like, whatever... So in that case, like if if this Kane was like a like a Sejuani or something, or a Zac, and this Annie was like a, like a Soraka or something, in that case, yeah, I I could not have gone Magi here because then I would be very vulnerable. But since I have so much threat, it's very unlikely that they will use everything on me because I can just wait for them to use one of the stuff and then I can just go in and I'm like chilling. So in these games, using Magi as like an offensive player is like a very good idea because the game gets chaotic very fast and and you will be able to thrive in the chaos when you have multiple threats on your team. So this is exactly what happens here. Uh, I already got two kills on my Magi, so that's very good. The Ari gets a kill back. She played it very well, actually. Now, this is another concept that we talked about earlier is they actually don't see when you do this. Like, I can go back here, and I, like, if I walk into this bush, they, they might still see me, but if I ult into it, it's like they don't. Now I will just, like, try to go for this play, because I can ult from this bush to this bush, but apparently it was actually worth it, and they were waiting for me, which actually makes this a very bad play, but... Yeah, if this wasn't worth it, and V was not hovering, this would be an absolutely amazing play. And that's, like, obviously on me, but, yeah, this this is something that you can look to do, like, this kind of play. Even though in this game it didn't work out, 99% of the time it will work out, as long as you have, like... Like, if I had Sweeper, it would have been the best play on the planet. But I didn't, so it was kind of... Like, this was kind of a flip that I did not have to do. But, yeah. The concept is still there, like, you can wood through the bushes. We get back to the game, 
I go mid here. I want to let Zaya take the bot wave. Now I have the E Everfrost, which allows me to like not use ult all the way out in the lane. And I have a very short Everfrost cooldown, you see, like I, I almost have it up again. That's because I have the the first strike cosmic insight and I also have like secondary ingenious hunter, right? This is what you need to get like so insane cooldown on Everfrost or Crown or all of those items, right? Now I will also look to like just clear vision a bit. Now we also I can use this uh, wave clear without having to ult him with my six hundred forty ult. This makes it very easy for me to like actually like play wave clear. And yeah, I mean this fight was a bit of a chaos, but yeah. Um, We get the bot wave, we start pushing bot wave and... Now this is also important concept. We go through the jungle, when your wave is pushing out like this, you should never go with the wave, it's a very big mistake, you should go through the jungle. Why is that? If somebody is waiting for you, either here or anywhere, here you have walls that you can use to like terrain scaling, like jump over, like you can jump over this wall, you can jump over anything, right? You have a million escape routes. Second thing, you, you kind of act as a ward, like if they have a blue trinket here, or like uh, a pink or whatever, like you can take this one. You can even use your sweeper when you enter this bush, like I did now, and walk into this bush, and when you walk like hugging this wall, and they are like standing in this bush, like they will not see you until you're like right here. At which point like your sweep sweeper will actually see them. So that's what I'm gonna do as well. I'm just gonna hug the wall, and... Like, since I actually spotted everyone on the map, I'm just gonna go for the wave. I'm just gonna crash it. But if if I if I didn't have that, I would actually just walk into this bush and... Like, if there was somebody, I could still use the walls to escape and I would be completely fine. But we got the crash and that's perfect. I can, I'm kind of thinking here. I, I want to both, like, get an extra wave because I just don't have enough for my item. I kind of want to hover mid as well. Like, these are all plays that I could be making here. But yeah, I think I'm just gonna wait for the Ari to push. And stay a bit longer on the map, because there's nothing immediate I could do. Like, I could buy my item, but it doesn't really matter. I'm full health, I'm... I'm not full mana, but the thing is, on Kassarin you have almost infinite mana sustain with your W, so I'm completely fine having this much mana. I'm just gonna go for the wave. Get my... Like, not wasting a single bit of XP. And I get this wave out. There's a bit of chaos happening in the mid lane, and now I can reset without, like, wasting any waves or anything. So this is kinda nice. I still get my item very comfortably. Now I want to get to the side lane. This is when you want to get to the side lane. There's no objectives. No Herald, no Baron, no Drake. You don't want to be mid here, you don't want to autopilot Aram, you want to go to the side lane, you want to create the 1v1, you want to eat waves, solo XP. Kind of plague mindset, you know? So you have to get to the side and you have to... You have to get fed, you have to get strong through resources. Especially now, since I'm missing like... As you can see, I'm literally missing like 200 gold for my item spike. This is very important for you to like, not fight in a position like this. And this is a very winning game state for us. Even though the game still looks like they have twice our kills, you see? They have so much, like they are very strong. But since we have a game state where everyone just farms freely, they don't really have the wave clear, they don't really have the threat onto us, we can completely just keep this game state up. And in five minutes we auto win. And this is one of those Kassarin things where, like you will have so many games, where if, if you don't like, if there's nothing happening, that's a win for you. It's like, just not making a play is the winning play. And that's that's going to happen so many times in your games as well. That you should definitely look to create these situations where you can eat freely and they don't threaten anything. In these two minutes, if I look for a fight, it's int. I should not actively look for a fight unless it's very free for me. Right? Now, since there's this opportunistic roam kind of thing, 
I can go there, but... Again, you see? This is bad. Why is this bad? My body language is, like, saying that I want to look for a play. The real, like, good call would be just me recalling here. Me getting my, um, my seraphs. Not looking for a play. Pinging it off, just getting the wave. Getting back to the sideline. And then... Just playing it slow. And now, see, like, I made the game again, like, ten times harder for no reason. Now it's gonna be hard to get a good reset. And, yeah. But, yeah, I chose this game because I made a lot of mistakes that I can highlight. And also, like, it's still... I kind of got away with it. But you you can see definitely, like, how, how the game, like, would have been like 10 times easier if I don't make these mistakes, right? So yeah, we get back to bot lane. I place a pink ward. I still want to play bot lane. I'm gonna go back, get my... get my wave on bot lane. I can't really defend this tower. But I can definitely eat the waves. And yeah. Looking for a TP angle here. But I might decide not to TP actually because I want my bot wave now. Because now imagine like here, this does not look like a favorable fight. And if I start, like if I compensation TP here, it's gonna make the game a lot harder. But me just getting the bot wave is perfect. Here I actually make the right call of like not creating chaos. Because if I TP there and die, like the game can be over at that point. So yeah, I'm just gonna eat some waves here. Kane actually gets the pick on the Gnar, which is huge. But yeah, Kane showing bot side might mean that the enemy just gets the Baron. Which is exactly what's happening. They got the Baron and... I can't really influence that a lot. That's the thing, right? Like, I, I have to be on bot side. Kane has to be on bot side. I can ping the Kane not to be on bot side, but... But yeah, I should, yeah, like in this position, I should be always on both side. I should look to side lane. I should to look to use my TP to join fights. Kassarin is very good at TPing two fights because you can actually like, even if I arrive here, I have like walls to jump over. So I'm kind of safe and I also can get very good flanks. So I don't mind like getting into the middle of chaos. Like when you're playing a victor or like something that's like, more of like a mage or something that's very vulnerable. Like they don't want to TP into the middle of the fight. They want to like be there for the for controlling the fight first and then like maybe TP to a lane. But Kassadin is one of those champs that just wants to TP into the fight and just be in the side lane for as long as possible. So yeah, here I got my two items. I'm gonna look to build AP. I'm going for a stat check setup. Yeah, here I'm gonna also look for a sideline. I'm just gonna look for where, like, food is, kind of. And also the next objective is bot side. So I'm just gonna go to the top lane. I'm just gonna eat my minions, and we're completely fine here. Yeah, I might as well, like, try for, to go for an all-in on her. Wanted to ult, uh, flash ult the second ult of hers. Because now I get this, like, E into Q Everfrost ult, auto W. And I thought like if I ult flash into her like location, I can actually like catch her. But her move speed actually caught me a bit off guard with the Magi and the Cosmic Drive. So I don't actually get the kill. If she ever backs up there, I would have killed her, but she didn't. She's She was playing this game very well. So yeah, now I'm just gonna get my wave out. Recall. And now, you see, I could have bought an item, but I'm so close to my... Like, I want to go Rabadon here, definitely. If you build, like, AP, if you have these kind of items, you want to go Rabadon most of the time. Either Rabadon or, like, if the game was easy, I would go for a defensive layer. But in this game, you can see, like, we're kind of behind. So if I don't reach the damage thresholds, I will not be able to, like, have a lot of threat. So I definitely have to keep that in mind. Yeah, we got the side lane waves. 
We can even give inhibitor. The thing is, if you get inhib, like Castrin is very good at clearing the supers. And we're kind of trading in hips now, so that's completely fine. And yeah, we're just gonna look to eat jungle camps. We're just gonna look to not create chaos until my team is grouping for an objective. You see, there's no objective on the map. I'm just gonna be on the sideline. Until there's an objective, I'm gonna be on the sideline. I'm gonna eat jungle camps. I'm gonna do whatever. And now, like now, there's literally nothing I can do. Did I get charmed here? But I'm not looking for chaos. Unless they just give it to me, right? But... Yeah, you see... You can kind of walk in the jungle and have a lot of terrain scaling as well. Yeah, we actually get a kill here. Seems like, yeah, they, they engaged onto us after I got low HP. But yeah. She tries to clear the wave, thinking that I'm not there or something. Maybe she didn't expect me to be there. Either way, I get a big shutdown. And this is when, this is when the game turns around. Like, one shutdown is enough to turn, like, one of the harder games as well. Because now, like, I have so much stuff, right? Like, I have so much, so many options to, like, make a play. Now, this is also very important to consider. You have the best terrain scanning in the game. You can get into positions like this, but nobody will suspect that you're there, and you can get one of these one shots. This is what you're looking for. This is the essence of Assassin-style Kassarin. You just go there, like, she will obviously go for this blue buff, right? Like, who could be in the area? Well, Kassarin can. And Kassarin, you should always look for this kind of plays. Using your sweeper for get, getting vision, getting, like, this was the old sweeper, but even if it was new sweeper, right, I can just use sweeper in this bush, ult over here, and then ult over to the blue buff, and I will be able to see every single one of those bushes. And if there's zero words, I can always get this one shot. And this is what will win you so many games, just, like, getting these picks. From like a safe position, like if even if she didn't walk there, I can still just like walk here and like ult over this one and then I'm just out, right? Or like ult over this way. Like I can do whatever I want here. But yeah, we got this pick. That gives me magi stacks and that gives her like minus magi stacks. And now the game is looking a lot better. Again, you see like there's a fight, I'm using my terrain scaling. My terrain scaling allowed me, again, I'm completely avoiding vision. What they see now is I'm out of the fight, right? They still don't see me. They have no idea that I'm even here. And I'm already here. Like, I, I can get onto the back line. I can get my damage off. And I can get out with my W and my ult reset. You see, I'm using W off cooldown, by the way. Like, very important. I go in. I go in with W. Like, W, I have to hit the W to get a lot of mana back. You see, I wouldn't be able to ult here. I get the W, though. Once I get the W, I have mana to ult out. That's very important in team fights. You want to get to the uh, backline somehow. And yeah, I mean, this... Like, this one pick... Into a good, like, flank skirmish... Is all it took to actually win this game. Even though I misplayed a lot, right? I mean, at this point, I'm just super strong. Because at this point, I can actually, like, be such a insane high damage. Like, you saw that Ari disappeared within, like, less than a second. And that is exactly what you're looking for. Just getting to the side lane, eating a lot of waves when you can. Creating those situations where you can eat the waves. When you can't, you, you will have a mid lane or doing, do something like that. And just be very strong for the moments when it actually counts. And this game, I made a lot of mistakes. Like, if I didn't make these mistakes, like, I, like this is the difference between, like, a 500-600 LP player and a challenger player, right? Like, these mistakes that we highlighted. And now you have the information to not make these mistakes and actually become a challenger player yourself, so... I wish you good luck on the journey and have a good one.